What's up guys? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to, What if I was reborn in Naruto as Branch Yuga? Becoming a Villain, Part 3. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Tsunade Senju is undoubtedly the princess of Kanoha. She is not only one of the legendary Sanin, but also the cherished granddaughter of the first Hokage, god of Shinobi Hashirama Senju. Compared to her invincible husband, Hashirama's wife, Mito Uzumaki, is less renowned. Even the current Kanoha Shinobi, who have seen her in person remember her as a very kind old lady who loved the village and supported and protected everyone she loved. However, Tsunade, as her granddaughter, still remembers the immense power of Fuinjutsu. How powerful are Fuinjutsu? Few can say for sure in the current Shinobi world, as this vast and profound system has declined. Not many remember that Mito Uzumaki's prowess in Fuinjutsu was so advanced that she could suppress and seal the full Nine Tails. Though she couldn't communicate with it, controlling its chakra was effortless. After Hashirama's death, she remained Kanoha's strongest force for a long time. Back then, the Uzumaki clan, who had a long-standing alliance with the Senju clan, stood out in the world thanks to their powerful Fuinjutsu. However, this also made them targets of fear and envy from multiple countries and shinobi clans. After a tragic event that no one in the shinobi world speaks of, the land of whirlpools was destroyed, and the Uzumaki clan scattered, their name barely surviving. Since then, Fuinjutsu have declined, and truly world-altering Grand Fuinjutsu have been lost. But Tsunade knows that the village holds many treasured manuscripts on Fuinjutsu. Back when her grandmother married her grandfather, it was a grand union that moved the entire shinobi world, and her dowry included a wealth of knowledge on Fuinjutsu. Shiki Fujin, Four Symbols Seal, In Seal. Some powerful Fuinjutsu are still in the hands of Kanoha Shinobi. However, despite their power, Fuinjutsu have a high entry barrier, much like space-time ninjutsu, reserved for geniuses. Ordinary people delving into Fuinjutsu might find practicing a few fire-style jutsus more practical. Tsunade, rubbing the purple diamond-shaped mark on her forehead, called out to Yudo, Yudo, come here. What is it, sensei? The branch family boy stood before the blonde woman, still using mystical palm technique on his arm. Fortunately, the bleeding had stopped, and the wound was bandaged, so Tsunade wasn't triggered by her hemophobia. Yudo, Tsunade tapped his forehead protector. I want you to try a technique. Do you know the mark on my forehead? Yes, you mentioned it to me, Yudo nodded. In seal. Now, I want to teach you this technique. Tsunade paused to organize her thoughts. In seal is an S-rank auxiliary ninjutsu. Its function is to gather, regulate, and control chakra. Once you make some progress, a diamond-shaped mark will appear on your forehead. For advanced users, this Yin seal can be used to maintain youthfulness through its low output and fine regulation. My grandmother, Mito Uzumaki, also had this mark on her forehead. However, my Yin seal is different from the ordinary Yin seal. I've made many modifications and developed extended techniques based on these improvements. It's significantly different from the original version. I've named this mark. The strength of a hundred seal. In seal requires patience. The practitioner must spend a considerable amount of time regulating and accumulating their chakra to condense this strength of a hundred seals. Don't rush, Yudo. Take it slowly. Starting this afternoon, you will practice the in seal. But don't neglect medical ninjutsu, and your chakra enhanced strength. 
Yudo nodded solemnly, Sensei, I won't disappoint you. Good. Tsunade tousled the branch family boy's hair with a smile. Keep it up. Yudo asked a few more questions about practicing the Ean Seal, then returned to continue healing his injuries. Tsunade sat hugging her knees, watching her talented disciple. Her gaze was complex. To prevent him from feeling too much pressure, she didn't tell him everything. Actually, the primary reason for teaching him the Ean Seal was to test Yudo's aptitude for few injuts. Anyone can learn the Ean Seal with enough perseverance. It's just a matter of time. Most practitioners succeed in their fifth year. But succeeding in the fifth year indicates no special talent for fuinjutsu, just average proficiency. Succeeding in the third year shows some talent. Completing it in the second year indicates a genius suitable for learning fuinjutsu. Completing it in one year is incredibly rare, even among the Uzumaki clan at their peak. Such individuals are true prodigies, exceptional talents who, with careful nurturing, can become top jonin or even kaga level masters. Mido Uzumaki was one of these rare talent. In a way, the Ean Seal is a fuinjutsu talent detector. Tsunade had thought it through. If Yudo progresses quickly, showing significant talent in fuinjutsu, she would continue teaching him. If he shows no talent, she would find another path, using the simplest method if necessary. Since Lion's Fong Bite damages the user's body, she could use Creation Rebirth to heal it, enduring the damage and healing cycle. It's cumbersome but effective. In fact, given her personality, Tsunade preferred the second method, straightforward and reliant on her robust health. But she understood that her disciple, from the Hyuga clan, wasn't known for resilience or chakra reserves like the Senju clan. He wouldn't endure such repeated damage and healing. Eh? Wait, I feel like I've forgotten something important. The blonde beauty suddenly scratched her head, realizing something. She looked up sharply at Yudo. In the forest, about twenty meters away, the young man was treating his arm earnestly. He had a fair face, well-proportioned and slender figure, appearing like a pampered young master. But upon closer inspection, his hands were covered in calluses and scars, indicating rigorous training and combat. Tsunade opened her mouth but ultimately said nothing. She sat on the ground, muttering in a slightly self-defeating tone. Whatever, if anything happens the old man will back me up. I'll go talk to him later. That evening, at the Hokage Tower, Hiruzen Saratobi looked at his upright student in disbelief. Tsunade, you want to teach Yudo? No, that's not it. He paused, his tone becoming serious. You plan to teach high-level Uzumaki Fuinjutsu to a Hyuga branch family member? Tsunade scratched her head, attempting to explain. Yes, teaching my students the knowledge of Fuinjutsu is very reasonable. Hiruzen Saratobi remained silent, simply gazing at Tsunade calmly. He wasn't tall or particularly handsome and typically liked to hold a pipe between his lips, smiling warmly and chatting with others, much like a friendly neighborhood uncle. But when Hiruzen truly got angry, there was a formidable pressure that made one feel as if they were staring into an abyss, ready to swallow them whole at any moment. He was the Hokage, one of the five greats in the world, and his words and actions could determine the lives and deaths of countless people. The phrase, slaying millions in anger, wasn't just an exaggeration. Tsunade pursed her lips tightly, not daring to joke around in front of her sensei. Tsunade Senju. Hiruzen began, calling his disciple by her full name. I order you, in the name of the Hokage, to forbid teaching Yudo Hyuga the advanced fuinjutsu of the Uzumaki clan. Sensei, in this office you should refer to me as Hokage-sama, Hiruzen said calmly. Tsunade, you are the granddaughter of the first Hokage and Mito-sama. No one in the village understands the power of fuinjutsu better than you. Even a beginner can seal another's body and chakra. A master of these techniques can even bind souls. The highest level fuinjutsu can perform almost unimaginable feats, exceeding the boundaries of ninjutsu. 
The caged bird seal of the Huga clan can seal the optic nerves of the branch family, firmly and permanently engraved in both body and soul. The second Hokage once said that when using the impure world reincarnation to summon members of the Huga branch family, the caged bird seal still remains on their foreheads. If there is a way to lift the caged bird seal, then it might be achieved by the strongest Fuinjutsu. But we absolutely, absolutely cannot let the Huga clan believe that the Hokage wants to lift the caged bird seal. Even if the chance of Yudo Huga freeing himself from the caged bird seal through Fuinjutsu is infinitesimally small, we must cut off this possibility. It's a threat that could overturn the village. The foundation of the Huga clan is the Byakugan and the caged bird seal. The foundation of Kanoha's existence includes the strong shinobi clans like the Huga and the Ninja Academy. For the village, the caged bird seal must exist. After Hiruzen finished speaking, the Hokage's office fell into silence. After a long moment, Tsunade spoke with difficulty. But, but I am Yudo's sensei. If he has talent in this area, I have an obligation. What you teach is your choice. The Hokage's voice was light. But if that time comes, I will see him as a potential threat to the village's peace. Apart from fulfilling my duties as Hokage, I will have no other choice. If you dare to teach him advanced Fuinjutsu, I will kill him. Hiruzen's voice was light, but the blonde woman knew this was almost a final ultimatum from her sensei. Fine. Tsunade closed her eyes, speaking with difficulty. I will obey your order. Hokage-sama. Your choice is correct, Tsunade. Peace is everything for the village, even if it is built on sacrifices. Hiruzen sighed, perhaps feeling he was too harsh on his disciple, and softened his tone. Of course, Tsunade, apart from those few injutsu involving souls and other profound elements, I will not limit your teaching. The Ein Seal, Strength of a Hundred Seal, Creation Rebirth, you can teach these to Yudo. These techniques are already enough to make him an outstanding shinobi. Yes, Hokage-sama, Tsunade replied coldly. Hiruzen felt a bit of a headache, helplessly saying, Tsunade, stop thinking about it. I absolutely cannot compromise on the matter of Fuinjutsu. Tsunade still stared at him, refusing to leave the office. Hiruzen realized she was trying to negotiate some compensation for her beloved student. All right, all right, Tsunade. The evaluation day for Yudo and the others is coming soon, isn't it? I will find an excuse to reward him. Humph. Finally securing some benefits for Yudo, Tsunade snorted lightly and turned to leave. In the room, Hiruzen took a deep drag from his pipe, exhaling a cloud of white smoke as he murmured to himself, Pitiful caged bird. I'm sorry, everything is for the village. Yudo immersed himself once again in the tedious and repetitive training. The Ein Seal, Chakra Enhanced Strength, Medical Ninjutsu, and the Huga Clan's Gentle Fist were his daily mandatory practices. Besides these, as a shinobi specialized in Taijutsu, he also needed to train his physique, learn medical theories, and exercise his Byakugan, none of these daily trainings could be omitted. Although training was hard, Yudo found joy in it. The exhaustion and busyness made him feel he was progressing on his path, even if that path was filled with blood and death. Why did the power of your punch dissipate? In the rear mountains of the Senju clan territory, Tsunade grabbed Yudo's arm and slammed him to the side. The branch family boy's body crashed into a huge rock, his blood surging and his chakra flow disrupted. Stars filled his vision, and he drew in sharp breaths through his teeth. Yudo, you're mixing up gentle fist and chakra enhanced strength. Tsunade squatted beside him, tapping his forehead protector with her finger. The sound of metal clashing with her finger was surprisingly pleasant. The essence of chakra enhanced strength isn't brute force, but the cooperation between the body and chakra. Tsunade pulled Yudo up, standing behind him, and grasped the branch family boy's wrist, guiding him in throwing a punch. How does it feel? The blonde beauty asked. You smell nice. Did you use orange-scented perfume today? Yudo thought, but he wouldn't dare say that aloud. After pondering for a moment, 
he could only shake his head. Tsunade spoke softly, Remember, four chakra enhance strength. I am the chakra and you are yourself. Yudo's eyes brightened. He was genuinely intelligent and immediately grasped what Tsunade was trying to convey. Sensei, do you mean the chakra should lead the body? Hmph, still somewhat smart. Since you understand, continue practicing. Tsunade released him and walked to a large rock nearby, sitting down and resting her head on her arm, looking away. Yudo glanced at his sensei, feeling a bit puzzled. Lately, he had instinctively noticed Tsunade avoiding him, always keeping a distance, as if sulking alone, and her gaze towards him had a subtle hint of guilt, as if she felt she had wronged him? Strange, had she done something to him? Yudo couldn't figure it out, so he set aside his sensei's odd behavior and resumed his training. A gentle breeze brushed through the mountain forest, flowing between the trees, rocks, and the woman, and finally wafted into the boy's nose. It definitely smelled like oranges, he thought. Yudo walked through the streets, eating from a box of takoyaki. It had been ten days since he returned to Kanoha. The atmosphere was growing increasingly tense. Even in the streets of Kanoha, one could see fully armed shinobi, many dressed in gray armor, gear usually seen only in large-scale wars, rarely during peacetime. Three days ago, Kanoha implemented a lockdown policy, prohibiting all external shinobi from entering. Even within the village, masked Yenbu operatives would periodically check the identities of suspicious individuals. However, Yudo was never stopped. His pure white eyes served as a passport in Kanoha. There had never been a living Hyuga trader in the shinobi world. At least, not yet. After finishing his takoyaki, Yudo stretched and continued walking. At this time of day, he would usually be sparring with Tsunade in the Senja clan grounds, but today his destination was different. Kanoha's Jonin promotion examination was to be held today. Unlike the public, large-scale, Chunin exams, the Jonin promotion exams were rarely seen by ordinary shinobi. They were usually conducted in secret, with witnesses and examiners being significant figures in the village, including the Hokage. Not just in Kanoha, but in other shinobi villages as well, Jonin examinations were not public. The reasons were numerous, but the most important was to protect the information about Jonins. Jonin are the elite of a shinobi village, responsible for training new blood, leading teams in battle, commanding large-scale wars, and researching jutsu. From team leaders fresh out of the academy to advisors or even candidates for the position of Kage, the number and quality of Jonin are crucial indicators of a nation's strength. After living in Kanoha for 13 years, Yudo was very familiar with the village. Following the map Tsunade had given him the previous night, he quickly found his way to the end of a certain street. Activating a mechanism, a hidden door slowly appeared. Yudo entered and descended through a passageway, soon arriving in a small room with steel walls. Ah, uh, such a cliché mechanism. Yudo mentally complained as he entered. Boom. An iron gate fell behind him, and the steel walls flipped, revealing countless kanai and shuriken. The mechanism activated, launching them all at Yudo. The young Hyuga tilted his head, and in the next moment, his body spun rapidly, creating a spherical chakra shield with no gap. Clown, clown, clown. All the kunai and shuriken were deflected, none breaking through his defensive circle. Gentle fist. Eight trigrams palms revolving heaven. This secret technique, passed down orally in the Hyuga main house for generations, was known as the perfect defense. Branch family members had no chance to learn it. Years later, Niji Hyuga would also comprehend it through sheer talent. Similarly, Yudo also mastered Revolving Heaven through his own talent. Training in Chakra Enhanced Strength had deepened his understanding of punches. After mastering the Ean Seal, his control over his body and chakra became terrifying. Plus, having read about Revolving Heaven in manga during his previous life, he already understood its basic principle. Mastering this secret technique was only a matter of course. After the storm of projectiles, Yudo stopped revolving heaven 
and saw the floor littered with broken and deformed kunai, and the steel walls pockmarked from deflected projectiles. The young Hugo raised his foot, ready to search for an exit, when he noticed several papers stuck to the ground. They were explosive tags. Ha! Huh? Now this is a bit more interesting. Yudo chuckled. Without hesitation, he used the body flicker technique, instantly appearing by a wall. He twisted his waist, raised his elbow, and punched out in one smooth motion. Boom! A tremendous force blasted out, creating a large hole in the steel wall and the thick concrete behind it. Ignoring the exploding tags behind him, Yudo continued smashing through the hole. Boom! 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 Yudo began to understand why his teacher Tsunade liked to break rocks and trees with her fists. Watching everything shatter under his punches was quite stress-relieving. This fierce tunneling didn't last long. Soon, Yudo felt the resistance ahead disappear, and he finally broke through the thick concrete wall into a spacious underground plaza. There stood Kakashi Hataki with his white hair and half-mask. He seemed a bit surprised by Yudo's entrance, pointing at the large hole and asking in bewilderment, Yudo, why did you destroy the examination site? Examination site? Yudo tidied his clothes, smoothing out every wrinkle. I thought the test was to evaluate our sustained, destructive capabilities. Of course not, Kakashi replied, somewhat annoyed. That was just an appetizer, akin to a preliminary test, meant to assess our comprehensive skills as shinobi. It was actually a pretty clever design. After passing that trap room, we were supposed to find a scroll. Following the route marked on it, we would face several more challenges, testing our information-gathering skills, reaction under pressure, speed, endurance, and the variety of jutsu we know. Oh, Yudo apologized with a smile. Sorry, Kakashi. I passed it too easily. But I believe, as Shinobi, we should have no restrictions when completing a mission. Kakashi's eyebrow twitched in annoyance at Yudo's initial comment, but he widened his eyes in admiration at the latter half. As Shinobi, we should have no restrictions. Yudo Hyuga, you can still come up with such profound words occasionally. Kakashi shrugged. You're right. As Shinobi, to complete our missions, we must be prepared to do anything. Yudo, only a year older than Kakashi, was essentially a peer. Waiting around was boring, so the two chatted aimlessly to pass the time, keeping the atmosphere from becoming awkward. Gradually, more people arrived. Unlike Yudo and Kakashi, these were men in their twenties to thirties, seasoned shinobi who had completed nearly a thousand missions. Normally, the average age for jonin promotion was around twenty-eight. Yudo and Kakashi being promoted at their age was already astonishing. If not for the looming war and other factors, they would never have advanced so quickly. After waiting a while longer, no one else appeared. Click, click. The sound of unhurried footsteps echoed as several prominent figures of Kanoha arrived one by one. Among them were Hiruzen Saratobi and Tsunade Senju. Hiruzen Saratobi was still the same, smoking his pipe, dressed in his red and white Hokage robe, and exuding a friendly demeanor. Nabuhiko Hayes, Reizo Shinozaki, Miho Uchiha, Yudo Hyuga, Kakashi Hataki. He softly recited the names of the five elite shinobi about to be promoted. Three from prominent clans, two from civilian backgrounds, with representation from both the Uchiha and Hyuga clans. This jonin promotion assessment offered a glimpse into Kanoha's delicate balance. The five stood respectfully. Over the years, Hiruzen Saratobi had established significant authority in Kanoha with a mix of kindness and firmness. Even the proud Uchiha wouldn't openly defy him. You are the true elites of the village, Hiruzen paused, then solemnly continued, a tree has roots, a trunk, branches, and leaves. Each part is indispensable. To let this tree thrive and pass on the will of fire, someone must stand up to shield it from storms. I am glad Kanoha is about to gain five more sharp blades. A Chunin and a Jonin are entirely different beings. The former merely leads a squad, while the latter can decide the lives of dozens, or even hundreds. Often, 
the outcome of a battle or even a campaign hinges on a Jonin's decision. So, what do you think is most important for a Jonin? Hiruzen posed a question. Strength, came a female voice. The responder was Miho Uchiha. She had the typical Uchiha appearance and personality, beautiful, black-haired, and emotionally rich. During this period, the Uchiha clan had not yet reached the brink of annihilation and exclusion, so many clan members still had relatively outgoing personalities. She glanced at the four others beside her and sniffed like a villainous. A jonin must have the ability to solve problems in any crisis, that is, to be strong. Strength, huh? Hiruzen clapped his hands. An excellent answer. Yes, you and the four beside you are all exceptionally talented fighters. Any other answers? Complete the mission, Kakashi Hitaki said calmly, with drooping eyelids. No matter the sacrifice or the cost, a jonin must complete the mission. The death of Sakumo had hit him hard, Hiruzen thought, sighing inwardly but showing approval without favoritism. The remaining two shinobi also expressed their understanding, though nothing extraordinary, but they were not wrong. Finally, it was Yudo's turn. He rubbed his forehead protector, hesitated for a moment, and then spoke with a gentle yet firm voice, Lord Hokage, I believe that a qualified jonin is someone who has earned everyone's recognition and respect. Earning everyone's recognition and respect. Hiruzen was moved. Just like in the conversation six months ago in his office, this young Hyuga branch family member's response showed an extraordinary sense of the bigger picture and inclusiveness. But Yudo, earning everyone's recognition and respect is an incredibly difficult task, much harder than even mastering an S-rank jutsu. Lord Hokage, when walking the path of dreams, how can one speak of difficulty? As Yudo said this, he saw that, Tsunade behind Hiruzen had already smiled, her eyes sparkling, pleased and proud of his answer. Hiruzen took a drag from his pipe, suppressing his complex emotions and continued, All of your answers are good and correct. A jonin is the village's most elite shinobi. Leadership, psychological resilience, and combat ability must surpass those of an average chunin. You have all proven your combat skills and problem-solving abilities through numerous missions in recent years. In my view, you all deserve to become jonin. But to become jonin, you must pass a test. This is a rule set by the first Hokage. A one-on-one -on -one duel does not fully reflect your capabilities. Therefore, I have selected five A-rank missions. Each of you will take one. Complete it and return here, and you will be Jonin of Kanoha. Remember, you must complete the mission and return within five days. Even one second late, and you will be disqualified. Tsunade. Hiruzen stepped back, and Tsunade came forward. She took out five scrolls and placed them on the ground. Choose one each. Once opened, it cannot be changed. Miho Uchiha was the first to step forward. After picking a scroll, she bowed to Hiruzen and left the room without a glance. The others chose in turn, while Yuta waited for the others to pick first, displaying the so-called, cautious courtesy. As the student of the chief examiner, Tsunade, he didn't want to be the first to choose and risk suspicion of favoritism or secret arrangements. When only the last scroll remained, Yuto took it. He opened it in front of Hiruzen and Tsunade, glanced at it, and then respectfully said, Lord Hokage, my mission is number four. You surely know the details. Before I depart, may I ask to what extent should I act? Should I control the intensity? Hiruzen calmly replied, Don't worry about any diplomatic issues. If something happens, Kanoha will back you up. Go all out. Yudo almost smelled blood in the air. At just over 50 years old, Hiruzen was still at the tail end of his peak. His inner hardness and ruthlessness far exceeded his demeanor at the start of the series, many years later. Yudo bowed, not delaying any further, and swiftly left the underground. This was a time-limited mission, every second counted. In the closed underground space, Tsunade suddenly sighed, Sensei, I haven't seen these five scrolls on the village's mission board. Yes, these were drafted last night by me and Danzo, 
Hiruzen sighed. Tsunade, though Danzo is somewhat sinister and I know you always disliked him, sometimes he does make sense. In war, you cannot simply hide in your shell and wait for the enemy to attack. Yudo quickly returned to the Senju compound. He often stayed there now, even moving many of his daily items and tools next to Tsunade's place, using the ample excuse of training and serving his teacher. The Hyuga main family couldn't find any fault with it. Given the five-day limit for the mission, he didn't bring spare clothes, only taking his tools and some money before leaving the village, running eastward. Mission 4. According to Top Secret Intelligence, a team of elite shinobi from Kirigakure is heading towards the Land of Fire, led by one of the seven ninja swordsmen. Whatever their purpose, prevent them from approaching the Land of Fire. Please have a seat, gentlemen. You see, these are all homemade pickles. Just give me whatever. The man wearing a straw hat tossed a money pouch at him. The waiter caught it and immediately beamed with joy. All right, gentlemen, your food will be ready soon. Noticing that these men with straw hats didn't want to engage with him, the waiter wisely left, giving them enough space. After the waiter left, the group began to chat sporadically. This place is quite like our village. It's always so foggy. The Land of Waves is an island nation, after all. It's very humid. Once we pass through the Land of Waves, we need to be careful. Although our secret base on the Fire Nation's shore is well hidden, we must not underestimate those guys from Kanoha. They have Byakugan and Sharingan. Knock knock. The sudden knocking on the table halted their idle chat. The man sitting in the center took off his straw hat, revealing his face. As shinobi we should act covertly. Although shinobi are rare in the land of waves, we still need to be cautious. You should put the hat back on. The subordinates thought silently but did not dare to retort openly. They could only lower their heads and apologize. Sorry, Jinpachi-sama. M.M. Jinpachi nodded slightly, closing his eyes to rest. He was of average height, wearing a white headscarf with his beard tied into small braids. His lips were thick, and his left eye was covered with a black cloth, making him look quite eccentric. However, in the world of Shinobi, strange outfits were not uncommon, so he did not attract much attention. More striking than his appearance and attire was the large sword on his back. Whether it could be called a sword was debatable. It had no sharp edge and was as wide as a door. The sword's back was cylindrical, and its blade was covered, hiding its contents. Anyone from Kirigakure would recognize this door-like blade, adorned with explosive tags. The man carrying this sword was also very famous. Jinpachi Munashi, one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, the wielder of the explosive blade Shibuki. Revealing his true identity was a helpless act for Jinpachi. The explosive blade, Shibuki, was highly recognizable. Any shinobi could identify him with a glance, so wearing a hat wouldn't conceal his identity. As for sealing the explosive blade in a scroll, few among the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, including Jinpachi, would do that. They lived by their swords and earned their fame through them. If they couldn't grip their swords instantly, it would be an insult to the name Seven Ninja Swordsmen of the Mist. With Jinpachi's warning, his subordinates became much more restrained, communicating silently with their eyes as they waited for their food. Please come in sir. Have a seat inside. However, instead of their meal, another customer arrived. Draped in a raincoat, with his head bowed, a lone figure entered from the door and went straight to the table beside the Kirigakure shinobi. With his back to them, his face was obscured, but it was clear he was a long-haired man. These are all homemade pickles. The lone customer interrupted the waiter's spiel with a money pouch, speaking softly. Bring me a pot of good tea. All right. The waiter ran out excitedly, thinking that today's guests were particularly generous. While the waiter was thrilled, the Kirigakure shinobi were not as relaxed. The shinobi accompanying Jinpachi were experienced chunin from the turbulent Kirigakure. Their battle experience was richer than that of shinobi from other villages. 
They immediately recognized the subtle danger in the lone customer's position. The distance between the newcomer and Jinpachi was a delicate five meters. Just out of reach of Jinpachi's explosive blade, Shibuki, with a single step and swing. Distance is the most critical factor for close combat shinobi. He's an expert. The Kirigakure shinobi quietly grasped their kunai, looking towards Jinpachi. The renowned swordsman of the mist did not panic, simply staring at the newcomer, articulating each word. Kanoha? Yes. A straightforward question, a straightforward answer. Not hiding one's identity might be fine in peaceful times, but in this chaotic era, such honesty implied irreconcilability. A fine sword. That's the explosive blade, Shibuki, right? So, you must be Jinpachi, one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. Indeed. And you are? Jinpachi didn't finish his sentence as the newcomer turned around, revealing a handsome, gentle face and eyes as pure as white paper. Yudo, just a nobody. Tsunade's disciple, huh? This is troublesome. Jinpachi sighed inwardly. It had been half a year since Yudo became Tsunade's disciple, something the Kirigakure Intelligence Network couldn't ignore. So, Jinpachi, why are you in the Land of Waves? Yudo asked, his expression not unpleasant. He even seemed to have a sunny disposition. Traveling, training, sightseeing. Jinpachi grinned, baring his sharp teeth. I can do whatever I want, but what does it have to do with you? This isn't the land of fire. Yes, this is the land of waves, I know. Yudo chuckled. Finding you was quite a task, even for someone with Byakugan like me. Oh? So? Jinpachi gripped his sword hilt tightly. His honed swordsmanship gave him the confidence to close the distance and deliver a deadly blow in a fraction of a second. Yudo seemed unperturbed, still smiling. To be honest, my mission is to stop you from entering the land of fire. I'm a very sociable person, Yudo pointed to his face. My persuasion skills are decent, and I'm quite perceptive. I'm thinking, if I could convince you to return to the land of water, that would be wonderful, no fighting involved. But you know, both Kanoha and Kirigakure's top brass are cautious and intelligent. If I returned and said you were persuaded to leave, without evidence, the higher-ups wouldn't believe me. So, could you help me out by giving me your explosive blade, Shibuki? With that, the higher-ups would believe me. Of course if you refuse, that's fine too. After all, it's a treasure of Kirigakure, and I don't like forcing people. But, Yudo paused, his tone becoming gentle as if speaking to a lover. I'll bring back your heads and the sword. In the tavern by the lake, an eerie silence prevailed. After a long pause, Jinpachi suddenly burst into wild laughter, his voice growing louder and louder. Your arrogant brat. A massive explosion erupted, shooting into the sky. Due to his previous life experiences, Yudo understood one principle clearly. Many times, the things written on paper do not reflect the true intentions of the leader. The emotions conveyed through the leader's tone and expression are the critical information a subordinate should pay close attention to. No matter their purpose, stop them from approaching the land of fire. The mission brief gave broad completion conditions. Just stop them. Making Kirigakure retreat, deceive, intimidate, or negotiate as long as these guys do not approach the land of fire, the mission is considered complete. However, when Yudo asked, to what extent can I go? He distinctly saw Haruzan's indifferent gaze, his tone as calm as iron frozen in winter. Kill those ants from the land of water, twist off their heads, drain their blood, and bring their heads back to see me. This is what the third Hokage truly wanted to say. As for why he didn't say it directly and used the more moderate term, stop, in the mission brief, it was likely due to the special nature of the seven ninja swordsmen. Although they share a title, the combat power among them varies greatly. Some, without their famous swords, are only at the special jonin level, while some, like Kisame Hashigaki, are formidable even without their swords. Without knowing the enemy's combat power, 
No killing orders were given rashly. After all, this was an assessment for promotion to Jonan. Sacrificing potential elites' lives would be too wasteful, something Hiruzen would not do. As a scheming spy, Yudo was adept at reading people's minds and quickly understood Hiruzen's intentions. So he spent considerable effort searching for clues, and with the Byakugan's unique scouting and farsight abilities, he confirmed the location where Kirigakure's team was crossing in the Land of Wave. In the far-reaching vision of the Byakugan, he saw the Blast Sword, Shibuki, Jinpachi Munashi, a master, but only just a master, killable. Boom. The explosion's force was irresistible. Yudo didn't dare to take it head-on and rapidly retreated. Using the force of the explosion, he flew over 30 meters, his feet landing heavily on the lake surface, raising huge waves that eventually fell as fine rain. Yudo's clothes were soaked, the veins around his eyes bulging. Humph! He tore off the scorched sleeve, his expression void of emotion. Brat! A thunderous roar came from the side, faster than the sound was a large sword covered with explosive tags. Yudo suddenly fell back, dodging the sword. To Jinpachi's surprise, the arrogant and hateful Konoha Shinobi did not take this chance to distance himself but instead threw his hands back, slamming them onto the lake surface, propelling himself closer. Jinpachi felt a chill. When it came to close quarters combat, Yudo was an undeniable expert, thanks to his clan's heritage. However, someone who swings a large sword day and night naturally has strategies to deal with close combat. He leaped back with even greater speed, like a startled wildcat, and quickly widened the distance. Yudo didn't pursue. Instead, he stood straight, lifting his leg until the soul faced the sky. In the next moment, the leg came down heavily like a battle axe from the sky, chakra almost condensed into a point. Heavenly foot of pain. The lake water within a hundred meter radius was pushed away, lifted into the air, with the resulting waves crashing onto the shore, breaking trees and destroying roads. The soft mud at the lake's bottom was exposed. Jinpachi, unprepared, lost his foothold and could only fall freely without any support. Conversely, Yudo used the recoil from the heavenly foot of pain to attack again. Dodging the large sword, he punched Jinpachi in the abdomen. Due to the heavenly foot of pain, Yudo's chakra was slightly sluggish, and in haste. He only used his most familiar gentle fist. But that was enough. The chakra surged into the enemy's body, almost instantly destroying Jinpachi's stomach. Blood, mixed with visceral fragments, spurted from Jinpachi's mouth, staining Yudo's chest. Victory! Yudo's heart moved, and he aimed to kill, fingers poised to sever the enemy's throat. However, at that moment, a sudden force hit his left side. Jinpachi had detonated the tags wrapped around his sword. The self-damaging tactic had an unexpected effect, blasting both of them across the lake to the rainforest on the shore. Yudo's blood churned, but half a year's rigorous training had made him much stronger. His control over his body and chakra far surpassed the past. Swallowing the metallic taste, he adjusted his posture, landing in a water puddle in the rainforest without injury. Something's wrong, the water is too heavy. Yudo's movement slowed. In the Byakugan's view, a dense mass of water was creeping up his legs. Water prison technique. The Kirigakure shinobi accompanying Jinpachi finally joined the battle at this moment. As expected of elite Chunin, their timing was impeccable. They intervened just as Yudo landed, the moment he had the least control over his body. If it were an ordinary Jonin, being caught by the water prison technique would instantly turn the tables, making them a lamb to the slaughter. Unfortunately, their opponent was Yudo. Revolving Heaven the branch family youth shook his hands, first dispersing the heavy water clinging to his legs. Then, his body spun rapidly, chakra gushing from his tenketsu, forming an impenetrable spherical shield. Boom. The four Kirigakure Chunin, including the one using the water prison technique, were all flung away, thrown far into the distance. Yudo stopped spinning, his face pale. 
using both the heavenly foot of pain and revolving heaven in quick succession, had greatly drained his chakra, causing his muscles and chakra pathways to ache. This highlighted his current combat weakness, specializing in close combat with little to no mid to long range ninjutsu. Facing a sword expert like Jinpachi, he had to rely on his body, which was highly dangerous. Luckily, I already shattered your stomach. The branch family youth thought, focusing on the nearby Jinpachi. The sight of his enemy made Yudo's heart skip a beat. At this moment, Jinpachi knelt, holding his sword, neither fleeing nor begging for mercy. Instead, like a desperate beast, he screamed at Yudo. Die, kid! We'll die together! He intended to detonate the explosive tags on his sword completely. The diameter 30 centimeters, length 1 meter explosion scroll on the sword, even excluding the mechanisms and transfer cloth with explosive tags, it held at least 20,000 tags. At this distance, with my speed, it's impossible to kill him before the scroll explodes, Yudo concluded. Don't be impulsive, let's talk. Yudo's figure blurred as he madly dashed backward, trying to provoke the enemy with words to buy time. Ha 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 ha. D. Just die. Jinpachi screamed and roared. A mushroom cloud full of destructive energy rose at the island's edge. Hey 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 cheer up, today is your big day. Am I not happy? He looked at his friend in confusion. Of course not, look at you, your eyebrows are all knitted together. The bride won't be happy to see you like this. He glanced at the mirror. The man in the reflection was tall and handsome, standing in a luxurious hotel banquet hall, surrounded by laughing and chatting relatives and friends. There was a giant nine-layer black swan cake and a massive red rose flower bed, larger than a car. Many people were taking selfies and posting them on social media after editing. The man was familiar with the scene, yet it also felt strangely unfamiliar. Be happy you're marrying the woman you love the most. He looked into the mirror, pinched the corners of his mouth, and forced a smile. The man in the mirror revealed his canine teeth in a twisted, almost beast-like grin. He shivered and dared not look at the mirror again. Dum 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 the wedding march roared and flowers fluttered. Instinctively, he turned his head. At the end of the red carpet, the bride in a white wedding dress walked gracefully towards him. So beautiful. The man stared at her, lost in thought until she stood beside him. What's wrong? The bride chuckled. You look like you're seeing me for the first time. I just think you look very beautiful today. Oh? More beautiful than yesterday? Which one is prettier? Uh. Ha ha ha, just teasing you, silly. The bride laughed happily. Look, our little prince is smiling too. Little prince? We have a son. The man was momentarily dazed, then noticed the baby in the bride's arms. The baby's face was soft and pink, with tender skin, round and cute, smiling at him. My child. A soft feeling welled up in the man's heart. He reached out, wanting to touch the baby's cheek. The next moment, the man froze. He saw an ugly, glowing green mark on the baby's tender, white forehead. It was the symbol of slavery, meaning this child would be, like him, a caged bird. This cursed fate would pass down through generations, unchanged until the end of time. He felt ice cold all over, as if he had fallen into hell. The golden, resplendent banquet hall suddenly twisted, turning into a sinister, jagged cliff. His friends, guests, the bride, and the baby in her arms all turned into monsters, cackling with shrill voices. Once a caged bird, always a caged bird, for all eternity, you can't escape, your soul and body will never be free, not even death can change this sorrowful fate. The man's eyes widened in rage, summoning unknown courage. He raised his fist and charged at the monsters, resolute and insane. Kill! 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 Then I'll kill you all. Kill until no one dares to cage me. Even if I have to kill until I'm the last person left in this world, I will. Yudo suddenly felt a sharp pain. The pain came from his mouth, specifically the tender flesh under his tongue. The illusion shattered and rationality returned to Yudo. 
He quickly realized what had pierced his tongue and mouth. Before enduring the blast's impact, he had placed a shortened needle under his tongue. Good habits save lives, Yudo thought bitterly. Suddenly, he felt his face was wet. Opening his eyes, he saw a soft-bodied creature the size of his head lying on him, its eyes at the end of its antennae looking at him, both scary and somewhat cute. Ah, Yudo Kuen, you're awake. Katsuyu's voice was still gentle. Mm. The branch family youth groaned, his speech unclear. Katsuyu-sama, how long was I unconscious? A day and a half. That damn Jinpachi. Yudo snorted coldly. Even in death, he tried to drag me down with him. Yudo Kuen, anger slows down the body's healing. And your voice sounds strange. That's because my tongue hurts. Yudo sighed inwardly, brushing it off. Thinking back to everything that happened that day, the youth felt a lingering fear. The power of 20,000 explosive tags was immense, almost comparable to a tailed beast bomb. In the moment before the impact, Yudo only had time to do three things. Place the needle in his mouth to prevent saying anything wrong while unconscious. Summoned Katsuyu and hid her on his body for post-unconscious treatment. Desperately used lion's fong bite in front of himself to avoid being killed by the shockwave on the spot. As it turned out, Yudo's choices were correct. He survived, though in bad shape, but with arms and legs intact, he was fortunate in his misfortune. As Tsunade's disciple, he naturally carried life-saving items from his teacher. Tsunade had put her chakra into Katsuyu, who could automatically release the mystical palm technique upon summoning. This was a marvelous use of Katsuyu's division and chakra transfer, showcasing Tsunade's profound mastery in auxiliary and medical ninjutsu. Never underestimate anyone. Jinpachi, who only appeared in the Fourth Great Ninja War as an impure world reincarnation, possessed such horrific decisiveness and secret techniques. Yudo frowned, summarizing the gains and losses of the battle. My use of Heavenly Foot of Pain is still not proficient. The best place to use this technique is on solid ground. I should have acted first in that shop. Too much chakra was given to revolving heaven, causing the enemy to be thrown too far away. If I had captured those Miss Chunin alive and thrown them at Jinpachi, I might have delayed the scroll's explosion, giving me a chance to use body flicker technique to decapitate him. Not knowing mid to long range ninjutsu puts me at a disadvantage in fight. Although Lion's Fong Bite's charge speed is fast, my arm's endurance is still a big issue. In this battle, Yudo was very close to death. In fact, he hadn't spoken in his sleep for a long time. Being awakened by the needle just now also showed that his physical condition was extremely poor, lacking even basic instinctual alertness. He thought for a long time, took a breath, and wanted to stand up to move around, but he found his body very tight. Looking down, Yudo saw himself wrapped in bandages. Katsuyu couldn't have wrapped me up with her antennae. He couldn't say what he felt, standing there dazed. At that moment, a voice came from the cave entrance. My adorable student is finally awake. What's wrong? You look like you're seeing me for the first time. A blonde woman tossed an unknown fruit to Yudo, chuckling lightly. Let's go home, my Jonin student. In the land of fire, along an official road stretching from west to east, a bull cart clattered along. To call it a bull cart was a bit of a misnomer. It was merely a wooden cart with two wheels, and the animal pulling it wasn't a horse or a donkey, but rather a slug the size of a water buffalo. Yudo lay sprawled on the cart, basking in the warm sunlight. Tsunade was beside him, fiddling with a large, broken sword. The blast sword, Shibuki, quite a formidable weapon. I wonder if it can be repaired. It doesn't matter if it can't be fixed, Yudo lazily replied. Sensei, I think this thing's symbolic value outweighs its practical use. It might be good for lowering Kirigakure's morale, but in actual combat, it's not that impressive. A chakra blade would be sharper at least. In Yudo's eyes, the Shibuki didn't pose much of a threat. It was just a large plank covered in explosive tags, intimidating but clumsy and limited in attack method. 
My dear student, you underestimate this sword, Tsunade said as she lifted the shibuki to Yudo's face. Yudo wasn't lying down in front of his sensei out of laziness. He was bandaged like a mummy, making even moving his fingers difficult. Take a closer look at this sword. Yudo glanced at it but didn't see anything noteworthy. After Jinpachi detonated the entire explosive scroll, over 20,000 tags went off simultaneously, and the sword couldn't withstand that level of destruction. It was completely blown apart. The once solid blade was now pitted and separated from the explosive scroll, with only a unique silk cloth connecting them. The burnt smell emanated from the scroll, rendering both the blade and the scroll unusable. The explosion mechanism of this sword is quite simple, Tsunade explained, pointing to the charred inner cylinder of the scroll. The scroll's inner cylinder is lined with explosive tags, with a central drum connected to the blade by a silk cloth. The drum rotates, moving the cloth, which in turn transfers the tags to the blade. It's simple in structure but extremely difficult to execute. Yudo understood what Tsunade was getting at and sighed, because it has to constantly withstand explosive impacts. The silk cloth used as the conveyor must be exceptionally durable and capable of conducting chakra to activate the tags with minimal chakra. His eyes lit up, this silk cloth. Maybe it can be modified to protect your arms for performing the lion's fong bite, Tsunade said with a soft smile, but then her brow furrowed. However, as I mentioned, a cloth that can withstand over 20,000 explosive tags is incredibly tough and hard to process. Using her monstrous strength, Tsunade tried to pull apart the blade and the explosive scroll but only managed to leave small dents on the blade. It's impossible to tear it apart with brute force. Even the sharpness of a chakra scalpel isn't enough. I wonder how the Kirigakure folks made it in the first place. Yudo chuckled. Why not let the village's craftsmen try? They specialize in this sort of thing. Their skills are fine for making kanai and shuriken, but for special blades, I'd rather find someone else. Tsunade scratched her chin and said with certainty, Leave it to me. Then I'll leave it to you, Sensei. In this world of shinobi, unless required for a mission, any spoils taken from enemies are considered personal property. Money, weapons, all are kept by the shinobi. It's a perilous profession, and this unspoken rule exists in every world. Of course, the weapons of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist have significant propaganda value and can effectively lower enemy morale if used wisely. Yudo thought if the village asked for the sword, he would keep the special silk cloth and hand over the rest. The distinctive blade and explosive scroll alone would suffice for any demonstration. Besides the sword Shibuki, the other spoils included a few teeth, collected by Tsunade from the rainforest while Yudo was unconscious. Kanoha could analyze the chakra information within them to identify the dead shinobi, which would help determine Yudo's merit. Few would dare to fabricate such information. Most renowned shinobi have well-documented histories. The slug cart ambled along as the sensei and student chatted. Initially, they discussed how to modify the sword, but the conversation soon shifted to ninjutsu, the various shinobi villages' situations, and then to more casual topics. Yudo noticed how close Tsunade, Orochimaru, and Jiraiya had been. She shared many funny stories from their childhood, laughing heartily and appearing completely relaxed. The classic Kanoha team composition of two boys and one girl truly fostered deep bonds from a young age. Even now, in the 56th year of Kanoha, despite Orochimaru's inhumane human experiments, he still held a pure space in his heart for Jiraiya and Tsunade. If they were ever in danger, Orochimaru would risk his life for them, at least for now. Although the slug cart wasn't fast, it was a summoning beast with stamina far surpassing that of horses and mules. As the sunset's glow intertwined with Tsunade's golden hair, the majestic Hokage rock came into view. Cough cough, well Yudo, I'm leaving now, Tsunade awkwardly coughed. I need to cook for Shizen. Such a poor excuse, Yudo thought. Shizen has been handling all the cooking and housework lately. 
but he understood why Tsunade chose to leave now. The Jonin promotion test was supposed to be a solo mission. Tsunade had sensed his critical condition through Katsuyu and came to care for him without interfering in the combat, protecting the village's valuable new talent. However, it was better if people didn't see Tsunade and Yudo returning to the village together. There would inevitably be gossip. The villagers of Kanoha respected the Senju clan but didn't shy away from talking behind their back. People have a dark side to them. Alright sensei, take care. Sure, I'll leave the slug and cart to you. You'll arrive soon. I'll be waiting in the room for the Jonin promotion test. Tsunade suddenly leaned in, raising her fist. If you spill the beans, you're dead. She gently sliced through Yudo's bandages, releasing a pungent medicinal smell. Don't worry, sensei. Yudo flexed his wrist, feeling much better already. However, when he turned around, the cart was already empty of the woman. Beside him, there was only a lingering warmth and a single golden hair. In an underground chamber, Yudo stood tall, presenting a broken sword with both hands. One of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, Jinpachi Munashi, has been confirmed dead. He paused then continued. Before his death, Jinpachi triggered an explosive scroll, leaving no remains. However, I managed to collect his teeth, which I will send to the medical team for examination. Hiruzen ran his fingers over the broken sword, sighing after a long pause. You completed the mission thoroughly, Yudo Kuen. You are already an excellent shinobi. He returned the broken sword to the branch family youth with a smile. On behalf of the village, I congratulate you on becoming a jonin. I will never forget Hokage-sama's guidance, Yudo replied, bowing deeply. As Hiruzen stroked his beard and laughed, Yudo winked at Tsunade, nudging towards her ample hips. The blonde woman blinked, subconsciously reaching back and finding a thin straw stuck there. It must have gotten there when she sat on the cart. Yudo is indeed observant and meticulous, as expected of my beloved student, Tsunade thought proudly, not realizing anything unusual about her student's attention. Hiruzen missed the secret exchange between his student and grand student. He continued, Yudo Kuen, you received the most difficult task, which is why you were the last to return. But I am pleased that all five of you completed your missions. The will of fire burns, eternally. According to tradition, your promotion ceremony will be witnessed by the Jonin and high-ranking members of the village. Rest well these days, gather your strength. The future of Kanoha depends on you. After a few more words of comfort, Hiruzen finally got to the point. Yudo Kuen, here it's just you, me, and your sensei. As my grand student, I haven't given you any special treatment. Is there anything you want? I can grant it as a promotion gift. Tsunade played with the straw, signaling Yudo to think carefully before answering. Previously, Tsunade had requested Hiruzen Saratobi to allow her to teach Yudo advanced Fuinja. Despite being firmly rejected, Tsunade managed to secure some benefits for her student in a nearly stubborn manner. Hiruzen wouldn't alienate Tsunade over such a minor issue. Therefore, he chose this moment to speak, having carefully considered his words. Both Tsunade and Yudo owed him a favor. Why is the third Hokage offering me benefits? Are the other four getting anything too? Yudo thought. Trusting Tsunade, he spoke directly, Hokage-sama, during my battle with Jinpachi, I realized my current self is too weak. As a shinobi, my offensive techniques are too limited. So, I would like to acquire a long-range attack technique. A long-range attack that makes sense. Fighting Jinpachi up close with a gentle fist against his explosive sword must have been dangerous. Hiruzen thought for a moment and nodded approvingly. Very well. Yudo Kuen, I will select a suitable technique from the scrolls and have it delivered to you by the Yenbu in a few days. Yudo expressed his gratitude. Given Hiruzen's status, he wouldn't offer a mere C-rank jutsu. At the very least, it would be a high B-rank technique, possibly even A-rank or S-rank. The following days were relatively peaceful for Yudo. The tension in the village grew as the ninja world became more restless. 
High-level figures like Minato Namikaze frequently appeared in the Hokage office. Newly forged ninja tools and soldier pills piled up, and the number of bodies wrapped in white cloth returned to the village increased daily. For Yudo, however, this turmoil was distant. As a newly promoted jonin recovering from his injuries, he was respected and left to rest undisturbed at the Senju compound. During this time, both Kakashi Hataki and Yudo Hyuga were widely recognized. Kakashi, at just 12 years old, became the youngest jonin in the history of the Land of Fire. His genius reputation intimidated many. Yudo, at 13, though a year older than Kakashi, had an impressive background as well. As a member of the Hyuga clan with its Kekiai Genkai and Tsunade's personal disciple, he stood out. His Jonin promotion exam involved defeating a team of Mist Chunin and one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the Mist, Jinpachi Munashi. This was enough to attract attention from other villages. The village celebrated these two young Jonin, easing the tension before the looming war. The continuous emergence of new talents was reassuring for the villagers and lower-ranked shinobi. Four days after Yudo completed his exam, the promotion ceremony was held at the Hokage office. Besides the high-ranking members and clan leaders, all available jonin attended. The ceremony was brief, with Hiruzen Saratobi praising each of the five promoted shinobi before dismissing everyone to continue his meetings. As the leader of Kanoha, he indeed bore significant pressure. After the ceremony, Hayashi Hyuga, the clan head, approached Yudo with a warm demeanor. The main house is proud of you. You can sit next to me at the next clan meeting. I suggest Tsunade-sama and the Hyuga clan interact more. When will your lion's fong bite technique be added to the clan's secret scrolls? Hayashi's words were a mix of praise and subtle pressure, classic tactics from a superior to a subordinate. Yudo listened with a respectful smile, occasionally offering compliments, showing utmost respect, friendliness, and obedience. Their conversation ended amicably, with both seemingly satisfied. Days passed, and Yudo fully recovered, resuming his training and waiting for the long-range attack Jutsu promised by Haruzen as well as the impending war. However, the first significant event was Tsunade's sudden return. The blonde woman seemed weary, giving Yudo a complicated look before saying, Yudo, Shibuki has been reforged, but the forger wants to meet the user of this weapon first. Yudo was puzzled but agreed. Uh, sure, let's go then. All right. Tsunade placed her hand on the ground, drawing a complex summoning seal with chakra and said softly, Let's go to the Shikatsu forest. Being reverse summoned felt quite strange. If one had to describe it, it was as if the mind and body twisted into one for a moment, disappearing from the real world and reappearing in another place, returning to normal in an instant. After passing through this infinitesimal time span, Yudo and Tsunade appeared in a strange land. It was a vast, boundless forest. It wasn't exactly eerie, but the trees were enormous, each with a diameter of at least 20 meters. Their lush branches and leaves completely obscured the sky, and the ground was an endless swamp, thick with moisture. Normally, such a massive forest and swamp should be teeming with countless animals. But Yudo observed for a long time and saw no life other than the trees. Not even insects which are known for their resilience. This land couldn't sustain other life. This was the Shikatsu forest, the dwelling place of the slug sage. Don't bother looking. Aside from us, there's only the slug sage here. Tsunade exhaled, clearly not fond of this lifeless expanse, despite her senju heritage. Visit a few more times to get used to it. But remember, don't stay too long. There aren't even microorganisms here. Humans can develop serious health problems if they stay too long. You've been studying medical ninjutsu with me for over half a year now, you should understand this. Yudo blinked and said curiously, I thought there would be countless slugs here. How could that be? The blonde woman patted her disciple's head, noticing he had grown a bit taller. There's only one slug in the world. Those large and small slugs you see are all parts split off from the slug sage. Huh? But sensei, 
I always thought they seemed to have their own consciousness. When a slug splits, it includes its body, chakra, vitality, thoughts, memories, and consciousness, similar to a shadow clone. When summoned, it divides based on the amount of chakra used by the summoner. Only when they fully merge do they become the sage. You can think of those split parts as the slug's offspring in a sense. But after the summoning ends, they return to the original body. The idea of a unique existence like this reminded Yudo of the White Snake Sage of Ryuchi Cave and the Great Toad Sage of Mount Mayaboku. The branch family boy seemed to think of something and hesitantly asked, So, the Shibuki was reforged here? Em. Mm. Tsunade started walking forward with her student. That piece of silk cloth had very peculiar properties. It could conduct chakra and withstand extremely high impact. I had to rely on the slug sage. Yudo followed Tsunade deep in thought. Even in the manga, the three great sage regions of the ninja world were shrouded in mystery. Mount Mayaboku, the most frequently appearing, heavily influenced the main plotline. From the ancient prophecy of the Great Toad Sage to the Atsutsuki brothers about the Divine Tree, to the recent dreams and prophecies given to Jiraiya and the teachings of Senjutsu, the ancient Toad had always been watching the ninja world from the depths of Mount Mayaboku, subtly influencing fate. The White Snake and the Slug, both renowned like the Toad, were not as prominently featured in the original story. But now, in the real world of Naruto, Yudo had to consider the thoughts of these two sages. After all, the things he intended to do would inevitably change the destined fate of the Naruto world. Tsunade led Yudo for a long time until they reached a clearing. Surrounding it were giant trees and swamps, but this spot was an abrupt piece of flat land. In the center stood a stone platform with a long black bandage lying on it, and nothing else. The slug sage was nowhere to be seen. However, in the next moment, the swamp and forest trembled together, and a gentle female voice came from beneath the ground. Little Tsunade, Yudo realized that the slug sage resided deep beneath Shikatsu Forest. The natural energy and chakra emanating from her were so abundant that they created this strange forest. But precisely because the entire forest was under the slug sage's influence, no other life could exist here. However, Slug Sage, why don't you come out? Is it because your immense form might cause devastation, or is it because you simply can't emerge? Yudo had a blasphemous thought but kept his face neutral, kneeling on one knee with his teacher to listen to the sage's words. Little Tsunade, the item you asked for is on the stone platform. Thank you, Slug Sage. The blonde woman's voice was soft, as the slug sage had been like a guardian to her since her youth. Little Tsunade, is the boy beside you the one who signed the summoning contract last time? Yes, slug sage. This is Yudo. I greet the sage. The branch family boy spoke at the right time, his attitude respectful and impeccable. However, the immortal slug fell silent for a long time. Just when Yudo and Tsunade thought the slug sage might have fallen asleep, the gentle female voice rumbled from below once again. Yudo Hyuga, your eyes seem to reflect a future I cannot imagine. Yudo's heart nearly skipped a beat, and he almost used the reverse summoning technique to return to the real world. But he managed to hold on, controlling his muscles and calmly responding, May I ask, Slug Sage, what did you see in my eyes? As a Kanoha Shinobi, I hope for peace to appear in the future. Ah, the future. The slug seemed to sigh. No one can see the future clearly. Even we three can only glimpse tiny fragments of fate. Good, as long as you can't see it. You nearly scared me to death. Yudo breathed a sigh of relief in his heart. He glanced secretly at the blonde woman beside him and found her expression showed no sign of concern. Instead, she seemed happy and reassured. Seeing him look, she even grinned at him. To Tsunade, the slug sage's mention of an unimaginable future probably sounded like a compliment, suggesting her disciple had the potential to reach extraordinary heights as a shinobi. Little Tsunade, take the new ninja tool back to Kanoha. Let Yudo stay. An old sage like me needs to talk more with the younger generation. 
Tsunade, unsuspecting, replied cheerfully, Sure. She went to the stone platform, took the black bandage, and patted Yudo on the shoulder. Keep the slug sage company. Having been under the care of the slug sage for over twenty years, Tsunade had deep trust in her, similar to Jiraiya's relationship with the toad sage. Yudo watched helplessly as Tsunade left, feeling a bit like a child left behind by a parent going off to gambling. After Tsunade left, the slug sage's voice echoed again, this time even more direct. Many, many years ago, a man who foresaw fate made a prophecy about us three. The immortal sage paused, seemingly reminiscing about the man's words. The toad will die of old age, the snake will shed its skin, and the slug will live forever. Perhaps it is destiny stirring. The voice of the slug sage rumbled from the depths of the earth, making every drop of liquid in the swamp and every leaf in the vast forest tremble. A dozen days ago, young Tsunade brought the blast's word. Shibuki. That extremely tough silk cloth was a piece of that man's clothing. Even after a thousand years, I recognized it at a glance. That man is the Sage of Six Paths. The Sage of Six Paths. Did he once predict the fates of the toads, white snakes, and slugs of the three great lands? Yudo was moved. He remained silent, still kneeling as he listened. The toad dies of old age, so that guy is getting increasingly decrepit. The last time we met, his skin was hanging down to the ground. The white snake sheds its skin and hibernates in Ryuchi Cave year-round, so it barely changes its appearance. It's the laziest and most leisurely. The slug is immortal, ha 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 ha. The ever-living sage suddenly burst into laughter, with no intention of stopping. Yudo's intuition told him that this laughter contained emotions far from joy. The slug sage only stopped laughing when all the trees within dozens of kilometers had collapsed. Anyway, everything runs according to the sage of Six Paths prophecy. He is the founder of the chakra and the first to comprehend the true essence of chakra. His power is ancient and unmatched, and those eyes of his can see far, far away. I enjoy immortality but must also accept this fate. Even after another thousand years, the slug will not die and will still live underground in the Shikatsu forest. However, a small bird tries to break its cage with its beak. This is a trivial matter, so small it's not worth mentioning, like a new shoot sprouting from a great tree at Kanoha's gate. But even the smallest thing is different in my eyes. The gentle voice suddenly stopped, and the vast Shikatsu forest became so silent that you could hear a pin drop. Despite his thoughts being exposed, Yudo remained extremely calm, and deep inside, he even felt a strange sense of relief. He raised his head and removed his forehead protector, revealing the ugly green caged bird mark. Slug Sage, may I ask how you knew? The land of waves. Though you had a thin needle in your mouth to prevent yourself from talking in your sleep, the fluctuating chakra already told me many things. When that slug returned to my body, I knew. Don't worry, there are very few who can interpret emotions from chakra in this world. And at that time, there was only me beside you. The land of waves, huh? Yudo shrugged. So, what do you think of my idea? Let's look around the Shikatsu forest, the slug sage replied. Yudo almost laughed inappropriately, almost thinking that this ancient slug was telling him a cold joke to tease him. But clearly, the sage's answer was not a joke. The boy knew what the slug meant. What you want to do is none of my business. I won't interfere, and I certainly won't tell anyone. This answer fit the slug's identity perfectly. She had lived for a thousand years, existing long before the shinobi villages. To her, the affairs of the world were insignificant. To her, Kanoha's internal affairs might seem like child's play. In a few hundred years, everything would change. Maybe even the concept of shinobi villages would no longer exist, but she, the slug sage, would still live in the Shikatsu forest. After all, the slug is immortal. That is her fate. But this wasn't enough. Since the conversation had reached this point, it would be a waste not to push further. Yudo thought, not planning to stop here. 
If you truly believed in fair competition and didn't get close to the leadership, you'd never get promoted. Like all transmigrators, Yudo was a cunning outsider. Moreover, from the slug sage's words, it seems she wasn't satisfied with the fate of being immortal. Whatever you do, I won't tell anyone, was already a form of tacit approval. Though he didn't know the specific reason, Yudo sensed that the slug sage had some hidden expectations regarding what he planned to do. After a moment's thought, Yudo cautiously said, Slug sage, the world has become quite chaotic lately. Even the most peaceful and stable place, Kanoha, is stockpiling ninja tools and ration pills. As a shinobi, both for public and personal reasons, I will stand on the battlefield and fight the enemies. Given my current status, I'll probably hold a position and act with my village comrades. But, I also want a private space of my own. Yudo smiled wickedly, knowing the slug sage understood what this private space was for. Recently, I've set up a few underground bases to tinker with some scientific experiments. However, on the battlefield, certain items can't be moved easily, and I can't use sealing scrolls as their military supplies under control. So, can I summon slugs to help me transport them? If necessary, even store them in the Shikatsu forest? As a signer of the summoning blood contract, Yudo had the right to make such a request. What he truly meant was, when I use slugs for rogue activities, can you keep it a secret? Before long, the rumbling underground returned. Before this, if Tsunade asked, the slugs would tell her what you did with the summoning jutsu. But from today, it will no longer be the case. Your authority will be the highest among the summoners. The slugs will prioritize your commands. Of course, Tsunade or Kanoha, no one will know about this change. Yudo let out a sigh of relief. As expected, the slug sage understood the hidden meaning in his words, establishing a certain degree of mutual understanding. The branch family boy suddenly recalled an old saying from his past life. An old fox is cunning, an old horse is slippery, and an old rabbit is hard for the hawk to catch. Living in the Shikatsu forest for a thousand years, even a piece of wood would become sentient over time. The wisdom and thoughts of such an ancient creature were indeed difficult to fathom. Then, slug sage I Yudo will take my leave. Yudo understood the principle of quitting while ahead. He put on his forehead protector and was about to leave the Shikatsu forest. However, he didn't expect the slug sage's gentle voice to echo in his ears once more. Yudo, what's the weather like outside? The branch family boy paused then answered. Sage, it's very sunny. A very fine day. A sunny day. Yudo didn't quite understand, but he still respectfully left. The boundless Shikatsu forest was once again left with a sea of trees, a swamp, and the slugs dwelling underground. No one knew how much time had passed. Maybe an hour, a day, or a month, before the gentle voice slowly rumbled through the Shikatsu forest. A sunny day. The last time I basked in the sun was a thousand years ago. Tian, Ren Lao Jin, Ma Lao Fa, Tu Zhe Lao La Ying Nan Na. This phrase is a Chinese proverb which translates to as people age, they become more cunning. As horses age, they become more crafty. When rabbits get old, even eagles have a hard time catching them. Or an old fox is cunning, an old horse is slippery, and an old rabbit is hard for the hawk to catch. The meaning of this saying is that with age comes wisdom and experience, making older individuals, or animals, more skillful and difficult to deceive or catch. Leaving the Shikatsu forest, the first person Yudo saw was Tsunade. You're back? How was the talk with the slug? It went well, Yudo said, rubbing his nose. We actually had a lot in common. Haha, <laughs> when I was a kid I often played in the Shikatsu forest. The slug would even tell me stories. Here. Tsunade handed him a black strip of cloth. The slug took the fabric from the middle of the shibuki and forged a brand new tool using senjutsu. Its name is Ryun Steel. This black band was about one and a half meters long and three fingers wide. 
Yuta weighed it in his hand and estimated that its density was about one-third that of wrought iron. This was a piece of clothing once worn by Hagoromo Atsutsuki. Although not a six-paths tool, its excellent properties made it a treasure. The Ryun steel is extremely tough, very tough, Tsunade said softly. It's resistant to tearing and stretching, insulates heat, and doesn't hinder chakra transmission. You can even increase its hardness instantly by infusing it with chakra. It flows like a cloud but can be as hard as steel. While listening, Yudo slowly wrapped the band around his right arm. From his fingers to his shoulder, his entire right arm was bound with the black band. His chakra constantly flowed in and out of his skin, switching the Ryun steel between extreme softness and extreme hardness. It didn't take long for Yudo to figure out the trick. By utilizing a layered structure similar to shrimp shells, his fingers, wrist, and elbow moved freely, while the rest remained as hard as steel. Let me try that technique. He murmured. Boom. So fast. Tsunade was surprised as she turned in shock to see the young branch family member who had crashed into an abandoned house. Yudo pushed away the fallen beam on him, dusting off his head. His right hand, wrapped in the black band, was now covered with a one centimeter thick chakra arm guard. This guard enveloped his entire right arm, with fierce fangs at the fingertips, and the roar of high temperatures and gales buzzing like a beast's howl. The S-rank jutsu, Lion's Fong Bite, could now be used without any burden. You're too fast. Tsunade clicked her tongue. This speed surpassed most jonin. Even with lightning release to stimulate muscle speed, it wouldn't match Yudo's. Yudo exhaled and dispersed the lion's fong, retracting the chakra infused in the Ryun steel, making the black band soft again. He only chuckled at his sensei's praise and didn't refute it. Yudo knew that using lion's fong made him exceptionally fast. While using the body flicker technique, he placed his right arm wrapped in lion's fong in front to cut through the air, reducing wind resistance to almost zero. Moreover, since Lion's Fong emitted high temperatures, the air in front of Yudo would heat up significantly. With pressure constant, the density would decrease, causing the colder air behind him to move forward. Essentially, the air behind would push him forward due to molecular thermal motion. With no wind resistance and an added push from behind, combined with his already exceptional body flicker technique, it was hard for Yudo not to be fast. Lion's Fong Bite had three incredible points. Straight line speed, the hardness of the arm guard, and the final chakra burst bite. Powerful and difficult to master, Yudo wouldn't have been able to use it without injury if not for the Ryun steel. It's a really good tool, Yudo said, stroking the black band wrapped around his right arm. He apologized to Tsunade, sorry, Sensei, for wrecking a house in the clan compound. No problem, Tsunade said generously. It's better this way. Those houses have been uninhabited for years and weren't sturdy anymore. Yudo laughed, Sensei. I'll head to the back mountain to get more familiar with these. Go ahead. Tsunade waved her hand. I'm going to argue with the old man. Huh. He promised you a reward for being promoted to Jonin, but he's been delaying a jutsu. While Yudo practiced Lion's Fong Bite in the back mountain of the Senju clan's territory, Tsunade had already pushed open the Hokage's office door, sitting on the desk, glaring down at Haruzen Saratobi. Sigh. Little Tsunade, you're the only one in all of Kanoha who dares to glare at me like this? Hiruzen Saratobi sighed helplessly. What's the matter this time? Tsunade spread her hands in front of the third Hokage. Where's the scroll? What scroll? The scroll. The one you promised Yudo with the long-range jutsu. Oh? Oh, that one. Don't tell me our Hokage-sama has completely forgotten. Tsunade's expression turned menacing. How could I? Tsunade, I'm your sensei and the village's Hokage. At least. There's no one else here. Hiruzen smiled wryly, having no way to deal with his student. He had watched Tsunade grow up and spoiled her as long as it wasn't a matter of principle. Alright, Tsunade, tell me again about Yudo's strengths and techniques, 
and I'll think about what suits him best. Tsunade huffed but patiently began explaining. Hiruzen listened intently. He hadn't forgotten about the matter but had been under too much pressure recently. Moreover, there were few suitable long-range jutsu for Yudo, causing the delay. Giving a Sirank jutsu wouldn't cut it, and Tsunade would definitely get angry. Most B-rank or A-rank long-range jutsu were elemental jutsu, which wouldn't suit Yudo, who had trained in gentle fist from a young age. As for S-rank jutsu, Leaving aside the difficulty of mastering them, Hiruzen wasn't ready to grant them without significant merit. Plus, Yudo was already learning In Seal, and the series of Jutsu based on Creation Rebirth would require immense effort. It wouldn't be wise to overburden him. However, as Tsunade continued, Hiruzen Saratobi's eyes suddenly lit up. You said, his speed is very fast after using his new self-developed Jutsu? How fast? Not as fast as Minato's flying thunder god, Tsunade paused before continuing, but in terms of straight line speed, it's faster than lightning body flicker. That's indeed very fast, Hiruzen Saratobi thought, impressed. In that case, this jutsu would be perfect for him. He formed a secret seal and handed a scroll to Tsunade. Give this to Yudo. All right. I'll destroy the scroll after he memorizes its contents. The Senju clan's back mountain is vast, perfect for practicing this jutsu. Tsunade glanced at the jutsu's name, looking satisfied. Yudo will leave the village in three days with many, many others, Hiruzen said softly. Let him study this jutsu on the way. Tsunade paused, then exhaled deeply. The war? It's finally starting. It was Yudo's first time attending a meeting of this caliber. Hosted by Hiruzen Saratobi, with Jiraiya, Orochimaru, Tsunade Senju, Minato Namikaze, and Danzo Shimura all present, nearly all of Kanoha's jonin who could attend were there as well. This was a war mobilization meeting. Being a direct disciple of one of the Sanin and a member of the prestigious Hyuga clan, Yudo had no reason not to attend. However, he knew he wouldn't be speaking in such a setting, so he crossed his arms and stood quietly in a corner, listening to the prominent figures. Next to him was Kakashi Hitaki, Kanoha's youngest jonin, leaning against the wall with a look of boredom, seemingly sharing the same thought. Kakashi, Yudo asked curiously, why aren't you standing with your sensei? That would draw too much attention, the white-haired youth replied softly. As jonin, Using chakra to control their voices for secret conversations was a simple matter. Being the center of attention is too troublesome. Aren't you also avoiding standing by Tsunade-sama? That's because the clan leader is here, Yudo lied effortlessly. Look, Hayashi-sama and our Hyuga Jonin are all here. Tsunade-sama is present too. Where should I stand? One side is my clan, the other is my sensei. Standing anywhere would be awkward, although I don't mind. But as you know, the adult world is complicated. It's best for us two young fellows to stand together without drawing any criticism. Kakashi widened his eyes. Yudo, you're already thinking about such mature issues. I suppose it's only fitting for a disciple of the Sanin. Suddenly, a commotion interrupted their conversation, and Yudo and Kakashi quickly fell silent. Under everyone's watchful eyes, Orochimaru stepped forward. With long black hair, golden snake-like eyes, and a cool and composed demeanor, he exuded a unique presence just by standing there. Hiruzen Saratobi's voice reached every jonin present. Well then, I'll leave it to you, Orochimaru. Yudo sighed quietly to himself. As expected, in the Third Shinobi World War, Kanoha's battlefield commander was Orochimaru. As the Hokage, Hiruzen, surrounded by talented subordinates, couldn't personally lead the troop. He had to stay in the rear to oversee everything. There was no one more suitable than Orochimaru to lead the forces. Jiraiya was off wandering, taking a rather laid-back approach at this time. Tsunade was suffering from hemophobia and wouldn't survive the battlefield until cured. Minato, though powerful, was still too young and hadn't yet built up the necessary reputation and achievements, 
Danzo was more suited to scheming rather than leading in a major war. Following Orochimaru, Minato stood up. This super genius of civilian origin was one of Kanoha's vice commanders. There were several vice commanders, but Minato's position, immediately following Orochimaru, spoke volumes about his importance. However, no one foresaw that Minato would become the next Hokage. Based on seniority, Orochimaru's ascension seemed almost certain, with Jiraiya being a more likely candidate than Minato. Adult games are really complex. Yudo thought with a slight smile, closing his eyes as he stood quietly. This war mobilization meeting was mainly to establish the command hierarchy on the battlefield. With Orochimaru first and Minato second, the rest of Hiruzen's speech was largely repetitive. Fight for Konoha, for the peace of the land of fire, inherit the will of fire, resist external enemies. Hiruzen had given these speeches many times since becoming Hokage, almost making them a pre-deployment ritual. While not very practical, they at least provided psychological reassurance. Kanoha's rules were still intact, everything was orderly and are in under control. After the meeting ended, Yudo stretched his shoulders and was about to leave the Hokage building when someone called out to him. Yudo, can you stay for a moment? Turning around, he saw a clean, handsome face with a head of blonde hair. Minato Senpai, Yuto Stoppid. Due to developing the lion's fong bite, he had a decent relationship with Minato, at least on the surface. Calling me Senpai makes me feel old. Minato laughed, inviting Yudo into an office. Yudo, this war, Tsunade sama won't be on the front lines. Yes, I understand. Sensei's illness isn't cured yet. So, as disciples of the Sanin, I think we should take on more responsibility. Minato Senpai, what do you need me to do? Looking at Yudo, Minato's blue eyes showed sincerity and warmth. Yudo, because of my flying thunder god technique, I'll be leading the reconnaissance and raiding unit. As a Hyuga Jonin, your Byakugan is crucial to Kanoha's reconnaissance. So, I was thinking, could you oversee the reconnaissance unit for me? Yudo's eyebrows twitched slightly. Minato Senpai, I'm afraid. He paused, then continued. My position isn't suitable for leading the reconnaissance unit. I appreciate your kind offer. A branch family member leading the main family would be a huge joke. Minato seemed to realize this and apologized sincerely. Sorry, I didn't think it through. Sometimes I can be a bit slow. But don't worry, I promise that under my command, nothing will happen that puts you in a difficult position. Changing the topic, Minato asked. By the way, Yudo, I heard you recently obtained an Arank Ninjutsu? Yes, Minato Senpai, developed by the second Hokage. It's quite difficult. Ha ha ha, the second Hokage never made things easy for us, Minato laughed. My flying thunder god was also developed by him. Now that I think about it, it's somewhat similar to your new technique. Tonight, I'll write up some of my own insights for you. Assigning a significant task, sincerely apologizing, and offering a valuable reward, all these gestures left Yudo slightly move. A high-level master, a super genius, was not only trying to win him over and making promises but also offering priceless ninjutsu insights while showing great respect and appreciation. Perhaps Minato was truly a kind super genius, but it didn't mean he lacked political acumen. A truly naive person wouldn't make it as Hokage. The entire village would suffer. Thank you, Minato Senpai. No, Yudo expressed his gratitude, choosing his words carefully. Thank you, Commander. He deliberately omitted the vice. Yudo returned to the Senju clan grounds and didn't see Tsunade until dusk. After the war mobilization, Hiruzen called another brief meeting with the village leaders. The old man is getting a bit senile, isn't he? Tsunade plopped down on the tatami mat, her tone tinged with a sigh. He's getting more and more long-winded. Sigh. Sensei, will you be going to the battlefield this time? It depends on the situation. Most of the time, I'll be forming and training the medical corps in the rear. But if the situation becomes dire, 
I'll definitely go to the front lines. After all, I am a shinobi of Kanoha. The blonde woman rubbed her neck and lay down, stretching like a cat, pointing her toes towards a certain spot in the room. My dear disciple, that package is for you. Yudo picked up the package and found it was full of clothes, embroidered with the crests of the Senju and Hyuga clans. Custom made for you, using the finest materials from the Land of Lightning. Oh, and I left a box in your room. It's filled with a thousand explosive tags. Practicing Grey Tunkle's technique consumes quite a lot. Thank you, Sensei. Yudo expressed his gratitude. Mm. Tsunade paused for a moment before continuing. You're leaving tomorrow? Yes, I've been assigned to the Kanoha Reconnaissance Unit, directly under Minato Senpai. We'll be heading to the Land of Hot Water in the morning. Although Minato is young, he's capable of handling things on his own. Yudo, remember, once you're on the battlefield, you can't treat him like the gentle senpai who guides you in ninjutsu. You must absolutely obey his orders. Of course, don't be a fool either. It's not bad to keep an eye on things. Tsunade shared her wartime experiences, and Yudo listened intently. Time passed slowly, and soon it was completely dark. Alright, that's about it. Yudo, don't let the village down. Yes, sensei. The branch family boy bowed solemnly. I should get going now. Hayashisama asked me to come by tonight. Tsunade grunted non-committally, then softly said, Wait a moment. She hesitated for a while before turning away from Yudo. The last time the world fell into war, two men very important to me left me forever. The blonde woman's voice was soft. Don't die, Yudo. Yudo knelt silently before Hayashi Hyuga, quiet and still. Ah, Yudo Kuen, no need to be so formal, Hayashi sighed. Now, you are an outstanding shinobi, a jonin at the age of thirteen. I've heard that in the Warring States period, people your age could already get engaged, he joked. Do you have any girl in mind within the clan? Hayashi Sama, Yudo's voice was calm. I haven't considered such matters yet. You young people are too tense, no vitality at all. Hayashi shook his head, then his tone turned serious. Yudo Kuen, you've been assigned to the reconnaissance unit? Yes, Hayashi Sama. You are a jonin, so you will either act as a lone hawk responsible only to Minato Namikaze or lead a team. Either way, the responsibilities are significant. Hayashi took a sip of tea, speaking each word clearly. Yudo, Vice Commander Namikaze is exceptional, but he doesn't have a Kekiai Genkai and doesn't understand the Byakugan. Therefore, sometimes our own people are more trustworthy. You're right, Hayashi-sama. In critical moments, I will prioritize the interests of the Hyuga clan. Good, it's excellent that you have this awareness. Your parents were the same, understanding the greater good and willing to sacrifice for the clan. This is the secret to the prosperity of the Hyuga clan. Hayashi expressed a few sentiments, then clapped his hands. You all, come out. Yudokun, raise your head. Several young figures emerged from hidden doors within the room, all young Hyuga without forehead protectors, proudly showing their unmarked foreheads. They were all from the main family. Shinosuke Hyuga and Miko Hyuga were among them. Hayashi's voice rang out again. The delicate sapling grows into a towering tree because of its strong trunk. The branch family is the twigs and leaves. The main family is the trunk. Yudo, these young members of the main family will also go to war with the unit. Like all Hyuga Shinobi, you must protect them with your life, acting as the shield and sword of the main family, maximizing your abilities. Oh, this is Shinosuke and Miko. You've met them at the Hokage's residence. Say hello, you should all get to know each other better. Shinosuke approached Yudo and extended his hand. The jewel of the Hyuga, Yudo Kuen, we meet again. I hear you're a jonin now. Haha, <laughs> I'll be counting on you for my safety. Yudo stood up, his face expressionless. I will stake my life on it. Good, with that promise, I'm reassured. Shinosuke patted Yudo's shoulder, the atmosphere amicable. But then, Shinosuke suddenly reached up and lightly touched his own forehead, 
a faint, mocking smile on his face. You haven't forgotten that pain, have you, Yudo? Yudo silently stepped back, greeting each of the main family youths, memorizing every detail of their faces. All right, Hayashi waved his hand. Yudo Kuen, you may leave now. Rest well. I remember you leave the village tomorrow. Yes, Hayashi sama. Yudo left the hall, the expressions of the main family members inside unchanged. That night, they would remind and suppress many branch family members. Yudo was just one among them. Suppress, recruit, warn, punish, reward. These methods of controlling the branch family were something the main family had perfected, more so than their gentle fist technique. After all, the main family had been doing this for a thousand years. Whenever they heard others praise the Inazuka clan as the number one dog-taming clan in the shinobi world, the Hyuga main family found it amusing. Taming people was far more technically demanding than taming dogs. Yudo walked through the night in Kanoha. This was the night before departure, a time for older shinobis to give earnest advice, and for spouses to hold each other tightly. Even someone as high-ranking as Haruzen probably wouldn't sleep well tonight. However, Yudo's steps were light and brisk. Inside, he felt an unparalleled joy, as if he'd won the lottery. Though, something is a bit lacking. Yudo muttered to himself. He reached into his pouch, feeling and tapping it lightly. Ding. A crisp sound echoed at his fingertips, the sound of a small glass bottle shaking, slightly muffled by the preserving liquid inside. A grin spread across his face, tinged with a bit of madness. It seems I didn't buy enough. Yudo stepped on a thin branch of a large tree, his Byakugan revealing no anomalies. He quickly left, running forward, and every kilometer, he would lightly slash the trunk of a tree with a kunai coated in special paint. The main force following him would see this signal and know that this path was safe, with at least no large-scale enemy ambushes. This was the third day since the advance team had left the village. At Yudo's speed, this time would have been enough for him to run back and forth across the land of fire several times, but at this moment, the branch family youth had only just glimpsed the border of the land of fire. The war between nations, between shinobi villages, was not the same as a shinobi mission. Simply increasing speed recklessly was tantamount to seeking death. The Kanoha advance team was led by Minato Namikaze, consisting of two main components reconnaissance and tactical assault. The total number was not large, around 400, but it was filled with elite members. With strategic importance from the Byakugan, the highly powerful Sharingan, the most unpredictable attacks from the Aburane clan, the Inazuka clan specialized in tracking, and civilian shinobi as sacrifices. Just from the Hyuga clan alone, three jonin, including Yudo, were part of the advance team. Though the Hyuga clan had committed more forces to the main team led by Orochimaru, the advance team was more elite in terms of proportion, with hardly any genin present. After all, the advance team's task was to gather intelligence and eliminate key targets, certainly leading to clashes with enemy elite. If Minato's side had problems, the main force led by Orochimaru would also suffer. Yudo's task was to scout at the two o'clock direction as the vanguard of the vanguard. Besides him, there were experts scouting in every direction. He remembered that the one o'clock direction was handled by a jonin from the Uchiha clan. Though Minato is inexperienced, he is methodical in his approach. The 400 people in the advance team, none of whom were easy to deal with, were all made to follow orders without any issues during the march. Yuto Kuen. As Yuto stood by a tree, a voice suddenly sounded beside him. He turned to see Minato holding a specially crafted kunai with a technique inscribed on the handle, smiling brightly at him. As the vanguard of the advance team, Yuto and seven others carried a flying thunder god kunai with them. Minato used the godlike power of space-time ninjutsu to shuttle back and forth along the entire route, which was a crucial reason for his ability to control his subordinates effectively. Commander, Yudo stood up straight. Minato lightly bumped Yudo's shoulder with his fist. Looking good, Yudo Kuen, your chakra is very calm, not at all like someone on their first mission. 
Thanks for the compliment. I'm calm because we haven't encountered the enemy yet. We will soon. Minato pointed ahead to a dense forest that marked the border. We're at the boundary between the land of fire and the land of hot water. Knowing the nature of those Kumo Shinobi, an ambush could happen at any moment. Slow down a bit, Yudokuen, maintain an appropriate support distance from the advance team. But we have you, Commander. Minato smiled wryly and shook his head. The flying thunder god isn't omnipotent. I can't know exactly what you're facing. Yudokun, take a break for a minute before setting off again. Understood, Commander. Minato vanished from sight, instantly appearing beside another Kanoha Jonin far away. Yudo felt a bit envious. Space-time ninjutsu was truly advanced. Mastering any type could establish one's fame in the shinobi world. If Minato were a bit more unscrupulous, he could carve his technique marks near enemies and harass them incessantly from dawn to dusk. Imagine, just as you were happily eating Odin and singing, a handsome man suddenly teleported behind you, delivering a raisingan before disappearing. Even if not killed on the spot, constantly guarding against such attacks would be exhausting. Currently, even if Minato couldn't defeat an enemy, he could always escape, placing him almost invincible. The only way to kill him would be to lure him into a deadly trap. Yudo sighed, stretching his ankles, ready to move again. Over the past few days, Yudo had noticed that the morale of the Kanoha forces was quite high. Though many shinobi were nervous or even scared, overall, most believed that the ultimate victory would belong to Kanoha and the Land of Fire. This judgment was well-founded. The Land of Fire had the most fertile land, the largest population, and the strongest economy in the world. Their supplies and tactical equipment were far superior to other great nations. Moreover, at this time, Kanoha had an abundance of top-tier shinobi. The peak era Hiruzen Saratobi, the primetime Sanin, Danzo Shimura, Minato Namikaze, totaling six high-caliber shinobi. If things got desperate, Kushina Uzumaki was the Nine Tails Jinchuriki. Releasing the Tailed Beast was a doomsday move, sacrificing both sides. Furthermore, if the village was truly on the brink of destruction, Kanoha would undoubtedly use impure world reincarnation to revive powerful shinobi for a final stand. When faced with the Executioner's Blade, moral concerns would naturally diminish. At that time, no one could have imagined the war would last three full years, claiming so many powerful lives and causing events that reshaped the world. As Yudo daydreamed, a minute had passed. Following Minato's orders, he marked another signal on the tree he had rested on and sprinted forward. This time, Yudo was much more cautious. The closer to the border, the more dangerous it became. Kumogakure was known for its martial prowess and reckless behavior, requiring constant vigilance. Keeping his Byakugan active, Yudo crossed the border. Boom. Ha! Attacking right at the border! No wonder they call you Lightning Brutes. Yudo dodged an attack from an enemy emerging from underground, laughing as he mocked them. Despite his outward confidence, he was very cautious. This team of Kumo Shinobi had positioned themselves just outside the range of his Byakugan, indicating careful planning. A tactic against the Kanoha advance team. The branch family youth landed on the ground, striking the center of the enemy's encirclement like a hammer. He tore off his right sleeve, revealing a black bandage wrapped around his arm. One, two, three, four, five, seven Kumo heads as my first achievement, not too shabby. As Minato Namike's fingertips touched the tip of the kunai, he squeezed himself out of the space-time gap. His reflexes far surpassed those of ordinary people. In an instant, he surveyed everything around him. Felled trees, ground torn apart as if by a giant dragon, corpses ground into fragments, seven corpses of Kumo Shinobi stacked like a pile of bodies, and atop the pile of corpses sat Yudo, eyes closed, resting. The thirteen-year-old boy's long hair flowed down to his waist, tied at the end with a red ribbon. He stood tall and graceful. His right arm was wrapped in a black bandage, 
and his serene, gentle demeanor added a touch of mystery. Yuto Kuen, Minato called out abruptly, Are you hurt? No, Yuto replied, opening his eyes with a light smile. This level of ambush isn't enough to injure me. Commander, you should help the others first. All right, be careful. The main force will arrive in ten minutes. With a flash of golden light, Minato disappeared. As a top-tier skilled shinobi in the Flying Thunder God technique, his support speed was unrivaled in the shinobi world. He was everywhere on the battlefield. Yudo jumped off the pile of corpses, his expression calm. Overpowering his opponents with speed made victory simple. Although Kumo Shinobi's Taijutsu was among the top in the five great nations, they were still slow like lambs to the slaughter in the face of the lion's fong bite. Ten minutes later, the advance team arrived. Designated record officers evaluated the battle achievements, handled the Kumo Shinobi corpses, and filed the encounter. Afterwards, Yudo advanced with the main force, setting up camp in the dense forest near the border of the land of hot water. Time flew by as scouts sent out to explore the terrain returned one by one. Unlike Yudo, some were bloodied and barely clinging to life, carried back by Minato, who then handed them to the medical unit for immediate treatment. After crossing the fire country's border, the advance team set up camp, deciding to rest for the night to alleviate the exhaustion of the march. As night fell, the advance camp buzzed with activity. Light-hearted conversations filled the air, and the aroma of roasting meat wafted through. In a world with extraordinary powers like the Shinobi world, night raids on enemy camps were exceedingly difficult. For example, the camp's perimeter was guarded by Hyuga Clan Chunin at critical point. Their Byakugan's reconnaissance abilities surpassed thermal imaging cameras. Aburame clan members had scattered insects hidden in the soil, making underground attacks nearly impossible. High mobility shinobi patrolled in shifts, missing no corner. Sensitive traps were even set on various plants and rock. If Kumo dared to attack at night, they would suffer heavy losses. Moreover, the war had just begun. The shinobi's nerves were not fully tense, and it was human nature to relax a bit in a relatively safe camp. However, only ordinary shinobi could afford to relax. The advance team's commander could not. In the central military tent of the camp, Minato gathered all the jonin around a map. In three days, we need to advance to this point and establish a defensive line at the border between the land of hot water and the land of frost. We must intercept Kumo's attacks entirely within the land of hot water. Keeping the battle far from one's homeland was a principle every war strategist understood, applicable in any world. Minato, usually cheerful and gentle, issued a strict order. Three days. No matter what we encounter, we must push through. No one is to retreat without my command. Strangely, despite Minato's stern tone, his subordinates did not feel rebellious. Instead, they unconsciously straightened up. I will leave 50 people to guard the advance team and the rear supply route. The code will change every half day, and we must defend it at all costs. All remaining Kanoha Shinobi will join me in establishing a defensive line at the hot water and frost border. Kumo is strong. We may not encounter large forces, but there will be many skirmishes and ambushes. Including myself, everyone could die. I only hope everyone upholds the will of fire and exterminates all enemies. The handsome young man with golden hair paused and began assigning tasks. The main force will be divided into six groups, each led by two jonin. The first group, Genji Hyuga and Itaro Kuni. The second group, the rear guard will form 15 smaller groups. Finally, Kumo often employs single-point breakthrough tactic. I will select a few powerful shinobi for free action, allowing them to operate in the land of hot water or further to eliminate enemy small groups. Yuto Hyuga Minoru Uchiha Yuki Aburame. Minato listed several names. Standing against the wall, Yudo nodded slightly, accepting the order gladly. Due to the ongoing war, the meeting did not last long. When Minato dismissed the jonin, Yudo's bird roasting on the fire was still not fully cooked. 
He sprinkled a pinch of salt on the meat and, once the aroma wafted up, ate it with some water. In three days, the advance team would reach the border between the lands of hot water and frost. Yudo thought quietly, calculating the time and distance. Given Kumo's nature, there would certainly be a big battle in three days. Both sides had elite vanguards. The outcome was uncertain, but there would be casualties, with neither side emerging and scathed. Swallowing the last bite of bird meat, Yudo chewed slowly before standing up and walking into the darkness alone. He did not alert anyone. As a designated free action shinobi, his strategic value lay in unpredictability. Ideally, even Minato would not know his whereabouts. In this world where individual prowess could influence the outcome of wars, shinobis acting freely had significant tactical value. Each time they returned with intelligence or enemy heads, their war achievements would soar. Yudo disappeared into the darkness, carrying the token Minato gave him before the meeting, and quickly left the advance team's reconnaissance range. He ran deeper into the land of hot water, keeping his Byakugan activated, resting only when exhausted. For a free-acting, freelancer like Yudo, the biggest challenge was locating the enemy. The land of hot water, bordering the fire country, was under Kanoha's influence. In the early stages of the war, it was indeed difficult for Kumo to send large forces there. However, Yudo had his own way of finding the enemy. If they weren't in the land of hot water, he would go to the land of frost, heading straight to the land of lightning's border. He would eventually encounter Kumo Shinobi, 70 kilometers northeast of the border between the land of frost and the land of hot water. A convoy moved steadily along, not too fast, but orderly and tightly packed. This was a transport unit belonging to Kumogakure, carrying essential supplies for the front line, shinobi tools, food, water, and medical equipment. The main personnel for transportation were mainly genin and regular people, but Kumogakure had also assigned two jonin for protection, accompanied by five chunin squads. Normally, this level of defense would be sufficient even in the land of frost, but the atmosphere within the convoy was tense and few spoke along the way. Cowards, the lot of them. It's understandable for regular people, but shinobi cowering with kanai in hand? What kind of shinobi are they? One of the jonin from Kumogakure suddenly spoke up. He was from the land of lightning, with a fiery and straightforward personality. We haven't even reached the front line yet, and they're already this scared. If we were to face those Kanoha bastards. Enough, Jujiro. His jonin companion nudged him lightly. Chakra gives us strength, but it shouldn't strip us of our sense of respect. Spare me the empty talk. Jujiro Ueda shrugged impatiently. This is a battlefield, not a place for sentimental musings. Without the courage to wield our blades, how can we expect to win this war for the land of lightning? With Rakage sama leading us, victory is assured. Kanoha is strong, but those days are behind us. His companion's eyes gleamed with a fervent light. A Sama is invincible. Of course. Jujiro agreed with awe. Lions? Don't be ridiculous. Only cowards who harass our supply lines from the rear. His companion chuckled. If that lion dares to show up, we'll capture him and bring him back to the village. Rakage Sama loves rare and fierce beasts. Ha ha. The two laughed together without any restraint, and the others in the convoy, hearing their leader's laughter, straightened up, their nerves slowly relaxing from the grip of fear and worry. Jujiro and his companion had grown up together, sharing a deep understanding. What started as a mere conversation to relieve their frustrations evolved into loud, morale-boosting talk. Transporting supplies was also part of warfare, and if the convoy experienced a morale issue, delays could prove problematic. The reason for the low morale in the Land of Lightning's convoy was a cold, hard fact. Over the past few days, five transport routes through the Land of Frost had been cut off. The attackers were Kanoha Shinobi, striking ruthlessly and burning the supplies on site after eliminating the escorting Shinobi. Their speed and search capabilities were exaggeratedly efficient, disappearing immediately after success, 
leaving Kumogakure without a trace. According to survivors, the attackers possessed the Byakugan and a powerful jutsu likened to a lion's roar. In response, the leaders of Kumogakure quickly upgraded the convoy's protection to include two jonins. Rumor had it that top experts from Kumogakure had been dispatched, sworn to find the enemy causing chaos in the Land of Frost. The first direct confrontation between Kumogakure and Kanoha was set to explode along the border of the Land of Hot Water and the Land of Frost, making the supplies irreplaceable. While the Land of Lightning also dispatched experts to cut off Kanoha's supply lines, they faced the famous Minato Namikaze. Whenever something happened, Kanoha's support arrived swiftly, rendering Kumogakure's surprise attacks almost entirely ineffective. In this back and forth, Kumogakure had suffered a minor setback. This convoy's supplies could not be compromised. Jujiro and his companion understood this, maintaining vigilance and boosting morale while pressing on quickly to reach the land of Frost's border. Just as the two Kumogakure Jonin's efforts seemed effective, a flock of birds suddenly took flight from the dense forest ahead. A massive roar, akin to a beast's howl, erupted explosively. It's the lion. The lion. Damn it, we underestimated Kanahagakur Shinobi. Protect the supplies. His target is our food and shinobi tools. Prepare for impact. Defense team, ready. Voices rose in succession, a mix of fear and anger, but overall, Kumogakure's formation held steady, their morale intact. The Land of Lightning was truly a military power, its shinobi exhibiting high tactical skills. Fuhira. M. Mm. The two Kumogakure jonin moved forward with perfect coordination, lightning chakra flashing around their bodies, activating their muscles. The Land of Lightning wasn't known for defensive jutsu. Against powerful foes, they often opted for direct confrontation. Roar. The lion's roar sliced through the forest, and almost simultaneously, Yudo appeared in the Kumogakure shinobi's sight, his right hand wrapped in a dark bandage. This kid. Too fast. The two Kumogakure jonin were startled, the lightning around them surged, but before they could act, the ground beneath them cracked with countless snake-like fissures. Lightning Chakra adhered to their muscles and metal weapons, and they slashed at Yudo charging towards them. Lion's Fong bite. Yudo murmured internally, his speed increasing again, slipping past Jijiro's blade before it fell. He grabbed the long sword of Jijiro's companion with his bandaged hand, fingers clenching tightly. The cloth around his hand instantly hardened, protecting Yudo's hand, as the gale and high temperature of his chakra-imbued arm armor erupted, mixed with the Hyuga clan's famed gentle fist technique, detonating violently. The long sword, forged through countless hammer blows by master craftsmen, shattered instantly. The Kumogakure Jonin flew back, crashing through numerous trees. Without the Land of Lightning's tradition of rigorous taijutsu training, his body would have been torn apart by this bite. Lion's Fong Bite was a powerful jutsu, ideal for frontal assaults against Kumogakure's muscle-bound shinobi. Defeating his enemy, Yudo chuckled lightly. Send another convoy, will you? He dashed to the largest cart, pulling out an explosive tag, and, with a quick motion, ripped open the cart's curtain, ready to attach the tag. But as he tore the curtain, a blade thrust out from inside. So fast. Yudo Hyuga thought, echoing the earlier sentiment of the Kumogakure Jonin. He leaned back, blocking with his right arm, the steel protecting him from the blade. Hmm. He retreated, his arm throbbing with pain, nearly numb. A burly young man wearing sunglasses emerged from the cart. A lone lion, a pretty pair of eyes, oh ho, what a surprise. I've never heard of Kimo Shinobi's being good at earth release. Are you trying to be a mole? Yudo massaged his right arm. Ryun's steel became as hard as iron once chakra was infused, but the fierce blow still penetrated his skin and bones, leaving his entire arm numb, fingers trembling. I'm no mole, I'm the cool killer, fool just chill, it's my skill. Killer B's tone was odd, 
akin to an amateur rapper eliminated in the first round of a talent show, but despite the humorous tone, his oppressive presence was undiminished. Wearing sunglasses with vibrant bronze skin, black pants, and a white sleeveless shirt that showed off his strong muscles, Killer B stood confidently. Behind Killer B, through a torn curtain, a round hole in the ground was visible. He had advanced through this hole to stand in front of Yudo. Eight Tails' tentacles dug that hole. I need to channel more chakra to my optic nerves to monitor underground. Yudo thought silently, veins around his eyes bulging further. The sound of rustling leaves came from behind. In his Byakugan's vision, Jujiro Yuda stood behind Yudo, flanking him with Killer B surrender, Kanoha Shinobi. You're no match for Lord Killer B. We promise you won't be killed here, Jujiro said, though concerned about his friend who had been knocked away. Oh, is this what you're after? Yudo chuckled, pointing to his eyes. Sorry, but my Byakugan has been caged. A Hyuga branch member. Jujiro was stunned. A Byakugan with a cursed seal couldn't be transplanted or removed. The plan was disrupted. He glanced at Killer B. The hunter's hands must be steady. Beware of this cunning bird, you heard. At the moment Jujiro looked at Killer B, he let out a strange howl and charged. Seizing the distraction, Yudo ran to the right. Killer B reacted swiftly, facing him after he covered only 20 meters. You're not rhyming right, gotta fight with all your might. Yudo shouted as his right arm roared like a lion. The monstrous strength exploded again, but before Yudo could strike, Killer B retreated using the collision's recoil. Lightning flickered, muscles fully activated, and he circled Yudo at high speed. An amateur constrained by rhymes. A true singer touches the soul, takes control. Bang 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 bang. Killer B's blade clashed repeatedly with Yudo's chakra arm armor. Whenever Yudo tried to break free, the lightning-wrapped blade forced him back. Yudo realized he was in trouble. Though Killer B had a quirky personality, he was extremely calm in battle and clearly identified the flaw in Yudo's technique. Lion's Fong Bite was a powerful jutsu that required a direct, linear charge to maximize its power. Yudo could defeat or kill most of Jonin with it in a head-on clash. However, Killer B found a counter. He struck before Yudo could build up speed, weakening each charge like a shield. Though alone, Killer B became a cage trapping the lion. A brutal technique feared the soft, continuous attack. But Yudo, a headstrong shinobi, had already prepared a counter-strategy. Stopping mid-retreat, he didn't charge again. Instead, he raised his right arm. The roaring arm armor changed. The chakra flow reset and the lion's fangs dulled, transforming into a giant hammer. Boom. Yudo smashed his fist into the ground. Losing the fang's explosive speed and impact, he gained even greater brute force. Lion's fong bite, earth slam, the ground within a hundred meters upheaved. Large rocks flew into the sky, dust surged, trees snapped, and the terrain was utterly destroyed. There's space. Yudo felt joy, using the body flicker technique to dash forward. Suddenly, the ground split beneath him. Two octopus tentacles shot up, binding Yudo with incredible speed. The branch member sneered, preparing to use Lion's Fong to blow the tentacles away with heat and wind. Just the mass of Eight Tails Chakra can't stop me now. However, as he raised his hand, Yudo felt a sudden exhaustion and pain. I don't have enough chakra, Yudo realized. He could maintain Lion's Fong for at least ten minutes, but he'd already used too much chakra, defeating Akumo Jonin and destroying the land. His chakra reserves were depleted. He wasn't a Senju or Uzumaki with immense chakra reserves. The chakra arm armor dispersed. Yudo had to spin and release Revolving Heaven while retreating. Bang. He was bounced away like a ball, landing heavily in the distance. Fool. You think you rule. Killer B rushed over, drawing a short sword. If he couldn't take the Byakugan, he'd kill its bearer. Ninja wars were always deadly. However, as Killer B landed, Yudo gave a sly smile, pointing to the ground. Goodbye, in his peripheral vision, 
Killer B noticed an explosive tag on his foot. An explosive tag? Just one? My lightning release can handle it. Huh. The eight tails Jinchuriki's pupils shrank. He recognized the tag. At the center was a circled Bao character, connected by lines to four identical Bao characters at the ends. The Land of Lightning, having ambushed the second Hokage, knew this technique well. Mutually multiplying explosive tags. Killer B smelled death. A massive chakra surge erupted, ominous and furious, like a natural disaster. Killer B roared, covering himself in the Eight Tails chakra cloak to withstand the powerful attack. One second, two seconds, three seconds. Many seconds passed, and nothing happened. Killer B looked at the tag, ripping it off with Tailed Beast Chakra. There was no reaction, no summoning marks for a chain explosion. I've been tricked. This is sick. Killer B dispelled the Eight Tails Cloak. Fool. Now my brother will scold me again, cause I didn't bring the pain, he muttered, a bit dejected. Indeed, it didn't rhyme. Somewhere in the land of frost, an inconspicuous mountain hollow. Yudo hid in a freshly dug tunnel. The tunnel was deep, with traps set at both the entrance and exit. It was close to a water source, and the loose soil was ideal for further digging, making it a textbook temporary shelter. The boy lay deep in the tunnel, panting heavily. His right arm still ached. The initial slash had actually reached the bone, and Yudo had fought through the pain against a formidable enemy, so escaping was a stroke of luck. Now he didn't even have the chakra to perform medical ninjutsu, so he could only lie on the ground, gulp down fresh water, eat a few soldier pills, and wait for his chakra and stamina to recover. Killer B, he's a monster, Yudo muttered to himself, feeling a chill. Aside from his training with Tsunade and Shizun, this was his first encounter with an opponent of this caliber. A body as tough as steel, perfectly honed taijutsu, extensive combat experience, an unyielding will, excellent situational judgment, and the beast sealed within him, a natural disaster. By the age of 17, Killer B was already as strong as a kage. Jinchuriki have this kind of advantage. Fighting against their tailed beast's power, an ordinary jonin would be defeated instantly. Moreover, even without the eight tails, Killer B's strength was above Yudo's. Throughout the battle, Killer B hadn't even used his full strength, not employing his most potent taijutsu, the lariat. In the end, Yudo had to throw out the unmastered A-rank jutsu, mutually multiplying explosive tags, to intimidate him, seizing the opportunity to escape. Escaping in one piece was already a big win for Yudo. The worst-case scenario he'd envisioned was being killed on the spot by Killer B, becoming a casualty in the early stages of the Third Shinobi World War. I wonder if dying now means I'd be resurrected with impure world reincarnation in the Fourth War. Yudo mused bitterly, pulling out a special explosive tag from his pocket. Multiplying explosive tags, this was what Hiruzen Saratobi had given him as a promotion to Jonin reward. Originally, suitable mid to long range jutsu for the Hyuga clan were rare. Hiruzen couldn't find anything suitable right away, but when Tsunade discussed Yudo's combat characteristics with him, the third Hokage had a sudden inspiration and gave him this technique. The straight line burst speed, faster than lightning body flicker, was truly impressive. Using this strong point as the core, a series of tactics could be built. Defining mid to long range, Jutsu hinges on the effective range for attacking the enemy. For speed type Shinobi, this effective range can be significantly shortened. Close range, mid range, long range, it's all relative. With someone as fast as Minato, any Jutsu in his hands is long range. With the speed of the lion's fong bite, Yudo could easily approach the enemy. At that point, whether planting explosive tags around or directly sticking them to the enemy wouldn't be difficult. After the second Hokage developed this technique, he often paired it with impure world reincarnation, sticking the parent tag on the revived person for suicide attack. In his past life, Yudo thought this attack method seemed foolish when he read the manga. But after transmigrating, he found his method of using multiplying explosive tags even less clever, 
simply holding it and charging forward. Of course, this was just the current attack method. Yudo had been pondering more usage scenarios and jutsu combinations these past few days. He valued this technique highly. Multiplying explosive tags seemed unremarkable at first glance but were actually powerful. Its core is the automatic summoning jutsu. One explosive tag explodes, summoning four more. Four explode, summoning sixteen, multiplying instantly until all prepared tags are used up. In the blink of an eye, thousands of explosive tags are summoned, with endless explosions that are hard to escape. In the fourth Shinobi World War, the reanimated Tobarama Senju used this technique against the Tentails Jinchuriki, Abito Uchiha, with great effect. The box of explosive tags Tsunade gave Yudo before parting was to support his training with this technique. Although the branch family boy hadn't mastered it yet, he had a few special tags in his pocket, which came in handy today to bluff Killer B. Fortunately, he fought Kumo Shinobi. If it were Kirigakure or Wagakure, they might not have recognized it. After lying on the ground for a long time, Yudo felt his chakra had recovered significantly. Leaning against the rock wall, he used medical ninjutsu to heal his body. This is where the advantage of mastering medical ninjutsu showed. Ordinary shinobi could only pathetically stick medical patches on themselves, while Yudo could heal himself, greatly improving his survival chances. The power of medical ninjutsu permeated his skin and deeper. Since it was his own chakra, the healing was more effective. Dead tissue was removed, new cells grew rapidly, and injured bones hardened again. Next time I see Killer B, I better run quickly. Feeling almost recovered, Yudo stood up, trying to move his right arm. This battle made him clearly realize his current combat strength. One on one, using only gentle fist, chakra enhanced strength, and Byakugan, he was at Jonin level. Using Lion's Fong Bite for a frontal straight line assault, if the enemy chose to confront head on, even a Jonin might not withstand it and could be killed on the spot. However, as they say, a shinobi's intelligence is a matter of life and death. As the war progressed, his fierce assault tactics would draw more attention, and strategies against him would become more refined, with ambush and attrition tactics being predictable responses. Although Lion's Fong Bite is incredibly fast, it's not a space-time jutsu, not so fast that no one can handle it. Multiplying explosive tags, with its infinite explosions, is a deadly move, best used unexpectedly. Mastering it is a great addition but not a game-changer. More power must be harnessed and combined to challenge higher-level opponent. The road ahead is long, Yudo sighed, rubbing his forehead protector in the dim underground. Today was the third day since he left the advance unit. Judging by Minato's marching speed, they should reach the border of the land of hot water and the land of frost by nightfall. Kumo's speed should be similar. If Killer B was here, could the renowned son of the third rakage be far behind? A confrontation was inevitable, eh. Yudo checked the tunnel with his Byakugan, ensuring there were no oversights before leaving for the surface. He glanced at the sky. The sun was high, suggesting some time before the battle erupted. He could rest for another two hours, eat something, and recharge. Licking his lips, Yudo prepared himself. Minato stood on the highest branch, his blue eyes scanning the distance. Even without the Byakugan's far-reaching vision, Minato could sense the dense chakra ahead. They're not hiding at all, he thought. The land of lightning, Kumogakure, was a formidable enemy, always warlike and strong, with a tough internal unity. It was a very tricky opponent. However, Minato felt no fear. With flying thunder god at his disposal, few could challenge him. He threw several special kunai as teleportation points and vanished, reappearing among his comrades. Minato-sama. Most of the Kanoha advance unit was present, excluding those guarding the rear, the fallen, and those dispatched as free agents. Over 320 remained. Some losses, but manageable. The enemy is straight ahead, about 5 kilometers away, Minato stated calmly, looking around. We will engage them there. 
The Kumo Shinobi arrived before us and set up defensive jutsu. Charging in blindly would be costly. So, I'll go in first to disrupt their formation. When you see the signal, engage them directly. The handsome young man with golden hair fondled his special kunai, speaking gently. Any objections? Whether Hyuga or Uchiha, no Kanoha Shinobi objected. On the battlefield, defying direct orders from your superior could be fatal. In the ninja world, where superhuman abilities existed, the art of warfare was less about strategy and more about sheer bravery and strength. As their leader, Minato Namike's charging first was the mark of a capable leader. Good. Minato smiled, then, everyone, let's hope we see each other again tonight. With the flying thunder god technique, even the Sharingan couldn't track how he disappeared. One second, two seconds, three seconds. After seven seconds, the forest five kilometers away erupted with dust and a series of explosions. The defenses and traps set by Kumogakure were swiftly dismantled, and lives were mercilessly taken. Roar. The remaining Kanoha Shinobi heard a furious beast roar. Despite the distance, the ominous chakra of the eight tails raised goosebump. Charge! Someone shouted, and the 320 Kanoha Shinobi rushed forward, arms flung back, sprinting at full speed. Upon reaching the battlefield, they saw the ravaged land and three clashing titans. The shock waves from their battle tore through the sky and forest, each burst of power deadly enough to kill an ordinary shinobi. Minato and the AB combo were at it again. Kumogakure's forces noticed the incoming Kanoha shinobi and, without hesitation, abandoned their injured comrades. The air crackled with the sound of lightning release. Without even a battle cry, both sides clashed brutally. In mere seconds, over a dozen shinobi closed their eyes forever. Uchiha's fireballs, Aburame's insect swarms, lightning-wreathed swords, and bronze-skinned warriors moving at high speed. Under the multicolored jutsu, the land turned into a wasteland, its ecosystem utterly destroyed. Even creatures hiding deep underground were pulverized by chakra. Limbs, entrails, and blood. Killing was the theme of this land. Whether a young genius, a seasoned warrior, or a person with a lover waiting back in the village, all could lose their lives here. For most shinobi, even most jonin, a small kunai could easily end their lives. Even with chakra in the world, people were no happier. But perhaps, even without chakra, humans would find other superpowers to slaughter each other. Those superpowers might be called steam, electricity, nuclear fission, gene programming. The world has always been a massive arena. Yudo paused by a stream. His extraordinary Byakugan was at maximum power, the veins bulging alarmingly as if they might burst. Even concentrating all his chakra into his eyes, Yudo could only see faint smoke in the distance. About ten kilometers to the battle center, he estimated, adjusting his chakra to maintain Byakugan at a moderate level. At that moment, a squad appeared in his vision. It was a small supply team from Kumogakure. Two Chunin, five Genin, and the rest were ordinary warriors from the Land of Lightning. Yudo frowned slightly. They were on a collision course. He pondered, hands ready to form a transformation jutsu. But before releasing his chakra, he stopped, remaining as he was. With a sigh, the young man said softly, Better be cautious and kill them. He drew two kunai, holding them ready, head lowered. Soon, the supply team saw him. Hey! You there! Who are you? Identify yourself! The leading Kimo Chunin shouted. Swoosh! Without a word, Yudo attacked. Yudo, who had trained in the lion's fong bite and chakra enhanced strength for seven months, surpassed these Chunin in power and speed. In less than a minute, the Kumo team was annihilated. Smoke rose as a massive slug was summoned. Please take these Kumo shinobi corpses and supplies to Shikatsu Forest for now. I'll deal with them in a few days. Sure, Yuto-kun. The slug enveloped everything with its soft body and disappeared in white smoke. In war, such missing squads were countless and wouldn't attract any attention. 
Yudo scanned the area to ensure nothing was overlooked before heading towards the battlefield 10 kilometers away. He moved at a moderate pace. His Byakugan was his main weapon. Every close approach risked being spotted by Kanoha Shinobi. However, after 3 kilometers, Yudo reconsidered and put on a menacing Hanya mask. As night fell, he smelled blood in the air. This was war, where countless lives fell into the vortex of slaughter, regardless of age or gender. Disappearances, deaths, crippling injuries, massacres, events that would cause uproar in peacetime hardly made waves in war. With the Hanya mask on, Yudo took a deep breath. War, how convenient it is. The sky gradually darkened. As time passed, the battlefield at the border between the land of hot water and the land of frost expanded. Both Kanoha and Kumogakure had their formations disrupted and scattered across the battlefield. Apart from those engaged in one-on-one -on -one duels, the rest were fighting in small groups, gritting their teeth against the enemy. Minato and the A and B duo from Kumogakure were no longer on this battlefield, fighting elsewhere. Only a few small skirmishes remained scattered across the vast border area. The battle was nearing its end. The victors would solidify their position at the border between the two countries, securing the upper hand in this long war. Eight trigrams palms revolving heaven, Shinosuk Hyuga shouted as he spun rapidly, creating an impenetrable shield of chakra that repelled two sword-wielding Kumo Shinobi. A flash of ruthlessness appeared in his eyes as he swiftly approached the airborne enemies, delivering a series of gentle fist strikes. The deadly chakra disrupted their internal organs and chakra pathways instantly. At that moment, a hand suddenly tapped his shoulder. Young Master Shino Suksama, a deep voice spoke from behind him. Let's go, these two are as good as dead. Humph. Shinosuk didn't turn around, his voice cold. Takuya, you let these two slip by. He addressed the fellow clan member directly by name, his tone distinctly hostile, a sign of strained relations. Apologies, young master Shinosuk-sama. Takuya stepped back, revealing his charred right hand. This hand is useless now. The Kumo Jonin's lightning release was too strong. Shinosuk grunted in dissatisfaction but reluctantly accepted the explanation. Several figures emerged from the forest, all wounded and weary. They formed a protective circle around Shinosuk, who, unlike them, was from the main branch of the Hyuga clan. The Hyuga were a ninja clan where the main family wasn't sheltered from combat but had to be skilled in battle. Shinosuk, having received elite training from the clan elders, was a skilled fighter and undertook missions outside the village. However, as a member of the main family, he was always guarded by branch family shinobi in battle. If danger arose, the branch family protectors would sacrifice themselves to ensure his safety. The protectors typically included one jonin and several branch family chunin, a formidable force with the byakugan alerting them to threats, making it difficult for any enemy to threaten the main family members' lives. After waiting a while, Shinosuk frowned. Where is Masato? Young master, Masato might be in trouble. He injured his ankle while covering our retreat. The ankle, often referred to as the root of the ninja, is critical. An injury there severely hampers a ninja's mobility, more so than a hand injury. Oh. Shinosuk nodded indifferently. Let's move. Yes, Shinosuk-sama. Takuya, when we return to the village, I'll request another Jonin guard. That is your right, Shinosuk-sama. Ha. Huh. What about having Yudo guard me? Unfortunately, he's a student of one of the Sanin, so that might be difficult to arrange. No one suggested rescuing their comrade. For the branch family protectors, the safety of the main family member was paramount. Shinosuk's indifferent attitude went unchallenged. The Hyuga clan was one where a minority of masters controlled a majority of subordinate. Despite sharing the same Kekiai Genkai and bloodline, the main family never considered the branch family, marked by the caged bird seal, as equals. From the moment the caged bird seal was created, everything was set in stone, even if the seal was originally intended for a good purpose. 
In the war-torn forest, Shinosuke was swiftly advancing towards the rendezvous point with his protectors, a place fortified by defensive ninjutsu, ensuring safety. Confident he wouldn't face military punishment for retreating early, Shinosuke knew six of his branch family protectors had already died, justifying his actions. However, as Shinosuke pondered ways to have Yudo assigned as his protector, a beastly roar echoed from the dense forest. Had they been Kumo Shinobi, they might have understood the implications, but Shinosuke and his protectors merely hesitated, cautiously adopting defensive stances. On the day Kanoha and Kumogakure clashed, the long-awaited lion's fong struck its intended target without mercy. A man in an oni mask charged from afar, moving with terrifying speed. His angle of approach was peculiar, with his chin tucked to his chest, maintaining a perfect angle that the Byakugan's 360-degree vision couldn't cover. His speed was such that none of the Hyuga could see his face clearly. Lion's Fong, a barely audible voice murmured. Almost simultaneously, the masked figure reached the Hyuga group. Shinosuk still couldn't see his face, but his Byakugan detected the chakra flow within the enemy's body. From the elbow to the shoulder, through the joint points, rotating to the wrist, this, this is the gentle fist. The young master's pupils shrank to pinpoints. Shocked and incredulous, he blurted out, You are... Bite. The last two words were roared by Yudo Hyuga. To maximize his speed, he reduced his raw power. At this moment, the bite didn't instantly tear the enemy apart. But the exchange of speed for power was worth it. Just before the branch family protectors could unleash their revolving heaven, Yudo succeeded in reaching Shinosuke. His chakra encased right fist slammed into Shinosuke's abdomen. Then, he extended his left hand, forcefully covering Shinosuke's mouth. His fingers tore through Shinosuke's lips, prying into his mouth. Terrified, Shinosuke instinctively bit down on Yudo's fingers. Blood spurted, exposing the bone in Yudo's fingers. Yet, the branch family youth seemed immune to pain. With maximum force, he yanked Shinosuke's lower jaw, tongue included, from his mouth. In the forest, Yudo, like a lion tearing its prey, was wild and ruthless. Blood spurted as Yudo tore out Shinosuke Hyuga's jaw along with his entire tongue. Due to the excessive force, the teeth sank into Yudo's fingers, but the youth felt no pain. His blood and chakra boiled together, roaring viciously within his body. Yudo grinned silently. He gripped Shinosuke's blood-drenched jawbone tightly and, with brute strength, smashed it into his face. Shinosuke's right cheek caved in, and his eyes rolled back as he collapsed helplessly. Eight trigrams palms revolving heaven. At this moment, Shinosuke's loyal guards finally activated revolving heaven. As dedicated defenders of the main family, these guards were trained in techniques like eight trigrams palms revolving heaven for defense. They coordinated meticulously, with two chakra shields spinning at high speed from left and right, converging right where Yudo stood. Bang! Yudo was sent flying, spinning in the air to reduce the impact. By the time he landed, he had been flung more than 10 meters away. Several branch family guards' faces turned extremely grim. This enemy with a Hanya mask was too adept at countering revolving heaven, as if he knew the technique himself. More importantly, he was incredibly fast. Fast enough to grab Shinosuke's collar just before the two revolving heavens connected, using him as a shield to withstand the impact. Yudo landed steadily, tossing the unconscious Shinosuke behind him and then sat on his body, calmly assessing the guards. Lacking high-speed advancement, a mere mask couldn't hide from the Byakugan's vision. The face under the demon mask was clearly visible to the branch family guard. With his right hand wrapped in black bandages, his handsome face, and being Tsunade's disciple and a jonin at a young age, Yudo was not only famous but also very recognizable. Yudo Hyuga, among the branch family guards, the only jonin, Takuya Hyuga, spoke with deep fear and confusion. What are you doing? Yudo first tapped the rough horn of his Hanya mask, then his left hand naturally fell onto Shinosuke's shoulder, 
a gentle gesture as if meeting an old friend. Crack. Yudo snapped Shinosuke's collarbone with one hand. The young main family member groaned, but did not wake up. Yudo, you've gone mad. Attacking the main family, you'll be executed by the clan. Crack. Yudo, stop. I warn you, Minato-sama could return any moment. Crack. No one dared to speak again. They watched Yudo sit silently on Shinosuke, a chill rising in their hearts. As seasoned shinobi, they understood Yudo's message clearly. There is nothing to discuss between us. Cold sweat broke out on Takuya's back. As a guardian, if Shinosuke were harmed, none of them would survive. Although I don't know his exact motives, he's holding the main family hostage. To prevent us from reporting his attack, he must intend to kill us. Yes, he's recovering chakra and gathering strength, torturing Shinosuke to keep us at bay. In a flash of insight, Takuya realized the critical point. He signaled, and a female subordinate understood, sprinting away without looking back. The remaining guards, including Takuya, all charged at Yudo. Yudo, since you need Shino Suksama as a shield, you can't kill him easily. We'll surround you, you can't kill us all at once. Even if you defeat a few, Rurina will have time to alert the clan of your betrayal. You can't win. Thoughts raced through Takuya's mind as he rushed to within five meters of Yudo. But the next moment, he stopped abruptly, like a chicken grabbed by the neck, uttering a choking sound. Yudo twisted Shinosuke's neck. Then, with a green glow of medical ninjutsu, he calmly gouged out Shinosuke's unsealed Byakugan. Thump, thump. Yudo pulled out two small bottles from a hidden pouch at his waist, placed the Byakugan in a preserving solution, shook it twice, and smiled contentedly. True despair filled Takuya's heart. He knew he had made a fatal mistake. He misjudged Yudo's chakra recovery speed and his ruthless killing intent. This wasn't hostage-taking. Yudo's goal from the beginning was to annihilate Shinosuk and all the guards. Takuya's ingrained belief that the Branch family wouldn't kill the main family made him completely misinterpret Yudo's intentions. In the shinobi world, one wrong step leads straight into the abyss of death. Scatter. Run separately. Takuya shouted, making the first correct decision in this dense forest. But it was too late. Yudo stood up, stretched his neck, and his right arm once again formed the lion's fong bite armor. From start to finish, he hadn't spoken a single word. Ha, ha. Rurina Hyuga clutched her abdomen, pressing on her wound. Even without the Byakugan, she knew her internal organs were badly damaged. Damn you. She muttered through gritted teeth, her consciousness fading. As the frontal battle neared its end, both sides formed small combat units. Acting alone was extremely dangerous. The moment she saw the Kumo Shinobi, there was no time for words, only combat. After several close calls, Rurina finally escaped. Her condition was dire, but the Hyuga Kunoichi pushed through the pain, heading towards the Kanoha Vanguard's temporary base. Yudo Hyuga, I must inform the clan head of your atrocities. She murmured softly, driven by vengeance, struggling through the dark forest. Finally, seeing the large Kanoha emblem, her legs gave out and she collapsed. There's a situation over there. It's a Hyuga. Quick, get a stretcher. She's severely injured. Where's the medical team? Not enough personnel. Too many wounded. Lying on the stretcher, the strong scent of medicine filling her nostrils, Rurina felt warmth and happiness despite being unable to move or speak. She knew she had reached the safest place. Damn it. Too many wounded. All medics are busy. Who else knows? Think of something. Uh, is that Tsunade-sama's disciple? Great. Rurina's lips trembled. She opened her eyes in horror but found even blinking difficult. Yes, I'm Yudo. Medical ninjutsu? Of course, I'm Tsunade-sama's disciple. Such a pitiful state. As a fellow Hyuga and village member, I'll save her. But her injuries are severe. Medical ninjutsu isn't magic. I can't guarantee full recovery. Alright, give me a room, I'll perform surgery. 
Rurina's body began to shake. Her strong will to live granted her a bit of strength. She tried to rise and shout out Yudo's betrayal, but a strong hand pressed on her abdomen, using hidden force that no one else could notice, suppressing all her movements and cutting off her hope. Don't worry, trust me. Our meeting here is fate. Yudo's voice was warm like a gentle breeze. It's okay. You'll be fine. This was the last sentence Rurina Hyuga ever heard. Yudo walked out of the room. As he was about to leave, two members of the medical team couldn't suppress their curiosity and asked. Yudo-sama, did the surgery succeed? Is the patient okay? Hearing this, Yudo almost wanted to laugh. The surgery was indeed successful, for Yudo. The patient was also indeed okay. At least for now, she was still breathing. Having studied medical ninjutsu under Tsunade for over seven months, Yudo's progress was swift. His clean and efficient eye-gouging technique was the best proof of that. Naturally, he couldn't let the Hyuga die directly, but she wouldn't live through the night either. A talented medic can manipulate blood vessels and nerves with such precision that it's hard to detect any tampering. After nearly eight months of medical ninjutsu training, Yudo knew exactly how to kill someone discreetly. By embedding chakra mixed with a volatile special drug into the bloodstream, it could flow through the heart, arteries, and into the brain's capillaries, forming a cone-shaped thrombus. When accumulated enough, it could cause a stroke-like effect, damaging the entire brain. Even if the brain was examined, no useful information would be found. Explaining this intricate process and complex mechanism would take Yudo half an hour just to describe. The surgery went well, and there's no immediate danger. Yudo smiled, wiping the imaginary sweat off his forehead. Take good care of the patient. Yes, Yudo-sama. Yudo nodded slightly and didn't leave immediately. To avoid suspicion about his treatment, he lingered around the medical unit for a while, genuinely helping out and saving lives. Gradually, Yudo's heart calmed down. Tonight's operation was risky. If anyone saw him kill a fellow clan shinobi, he would have to silence them, increasing the chances of exposure. Moreover, Takuya's strategy of having his subordinates scatter was an excellent choice, causing Yudo considerable trouble. After using Lion's Fong Bite to kill several branch family warriors, it took him a while to find and eliminate the rest. As for Rurina, who initially returned to report, intercepting her midway was out of the question. But knowing her destination solved the problem. Whether Rurina would leak information en route, think in reverse to avoid Kanoha's vanguard camp, or be captured by Kumo Shinobi, creating a bigger risk, were all uncontrollable variables. Although Yudo tried to prevent these potential mishaps, he couldn't eliminate them entirely. Yet he remained committed to his plan. Betraying the clan and the village was a head-risking endeavor. If one didn't dare to gamble their life, they might as well kneel and be someone else's dog. As the night grew deeper, Yudo used mystical palm jutsu to treat the injured, stretched, and left the medical unit. Being Tsunade's disciple gave him a high status in Kanoha's medical system, allowing him to come and go freely. Even if the Hyuga clan investigated Rurina's sudden nighttime death, they wouldn't find anything. The medical team wouldn't talk. The medical system, controlled by the Senju and the Hokage faction, was beyond the Hyuga clan's reach. Yudo headed directly to the center of the vanguard camp. Minato had returned. Despite the prolonged battle, the yellow flash's eyes still shone brightly. Clearly, Kumo's A and B combo didn't pose a life-threatening pressure. Today's battle solidified Kanoha's foothold at the border, opening a route for the main forces. Yuto Kuen, Minato greeted warmly, Welcome back, Kanoha's lion. Please don't tease me, Commander, Yuto replied, scratching his head. Don't be so formal when we're in private, Yuto Kuen. Call me Minato Senpai instead, and I'm serious. During the fight, Killer B, the Eight Tails Jinchuriki, mentioned that next time he meets you, he'll put his sword in your mouth. Jinchuriki. Yudo smiled wryly. I fought him today and barely escaped. He's incredibly strong. 
You possess exceptional shinobi talent, Yudo Kuen. Minato prays sincerely, his blue eyes full of admiration. Being praised by the yellow flash was a delight, and even Yudo felt pleased. After a few more words with Minato, Yudo reported his work and left the Vanguard's base. He was still a freelancer, returning to support during direct combat, then circling back behind enemy lines. No one could find fault with his movement. Far from Kanoha's reach, Yudo bit his finger and performed the reverse summoning jutsu. Amidst the dissipating smoke, he stood in an endless swamp, surrounded by towering trees. Besides plants, slugs, and himself, there was no other living thing. But today there was something different. Six Huga corpses were casually hung on tree branches, their blood turned dark red, dripping into the swamp. The central young corpse had twisted bones, hollow eyes, lacking any former vigor from activating the caged bird seal. Yudo looked at his blood-stained shoes, thinking about carefully cleaning his clothes later to leave no trace. Thank you, Katsuyusama, he whispered though no response came. He knew the deeply hidden slug sage must have heard him. Regarding corpse disposal, Katsuyu was an expert. Its unique structure could swallow corpses and debris, dissolving them with its slime. As a creature close to nature, Katsuyu's secretion evaporated quickly, leaving no trace. In the past, if Yudo had Katsuyu dispose of clan shinobi bodies, it would inform Tsunade. But now, the Katsuyu Sage had granted Yudo the highest summoning authority, allowing him to use it freely. As for whether Tsunade would happen to see the bodies in Shikatsu Forest, Yudo never worried about that. The Slug Sage, having lived for so long, would never make such a mistake. Yudo looked at his masterpiece on the trees, shrugged, and muttered, There are plenty of prime spots left in Shikatsu Forest, before starting to move the bodies. The special environment of Shikatsu Forest, under Katsuyu's power, allowed for the temporary storage of spoils of war that were not suitable for others to know about. The land of hot water, underground secret base large medical tanks lined up in a row, with the bodies of the Huga clan immersed in a preservative solution. The air was filled with a strange smell, a mixture of chemical reagents, treated blood and organs, metal instruments, and rubber. It was eerie and silent, perfect for playing gothic organ music in the background. Shinosuke Huga's corpse lay on a metal bed, his eye sockets still hollow. However, thanks to Yudo Huga's meticulous work, Shinosuke's body was now intact, no longer as horrifying as it had been when hung in the forest of bones. Actually, you look quite fine. Yudo stretched lazily, muttering to Shinosuke's corpse. He loosened his neck, then turned his back on the metal bed and the tanks, continuing to examine the two precious Byakugan. Extracted whole, these Byakugan were priceless treasures, worth more than gold. The Byakugan of the branch family would automatically destroy themselves upon extraction, unlike the main family. However, the main family's small numbers and elite protection made capturing one alive almost impossible. Tracking and even ambushing a reconnaissance master with long-range vision was an extremely costly endeavor. Yudo placed one hand over Shinosuke's extracted Byakugan and the other over his own eyes, channeling equal amounts of chakra into both, carefully discerning their differences. After a while, he lowered his arms, playing with the eyeballs and thinking deeply. His own eyes were deformed. This wasn't about shape or size but a deeper deformity. Density of optic nerves, chakra transmission speed, chakra utilization efficiency. The branch family, marked with the caged bird seal during childhood, had their Byakugan's abilities constrained during crucial developmental periods. To say this had no effect on the body was impossible. The branch family lacked more than just a degree of vision. Yudo placed the two Byakugan in a small glass jar and set it back on the table. He then moved Shinosuke's body into a tank and neatly arranged the five branch family members' corpses on a large metal table. Next, he began calibrating and cleaning various bizarre instruments. If Tsunade were here, she would recognize the set of medical instruments for treating certain blood diseases. 
Their function was to draw blood, treat it externally, and then return it to the body. However, Yudo had added many components to this medical setup, far exceeding its original design. Not only could it draw blood, but it could also crush bones and grind flesh. After completing the adjustments, Yudo placed a Huga Chunin's body into the funnel-shaped entrance of the instrument. The greatness of new technology lies in innovation and experimentation. This thought crossed Yudo's mind as he watched the body being consumed by the machine. He didn't remain idle but moved to the side, monitoring real-time parameters and continually channeling chakra with one hand. In the shinobi world, the pinnacle of medical technology inevitably involved chakra. Yudo aimed for purification, temperature, rotation speed, acidity, buffering solution composition, chakra ratio, the sequence and timing of each purification step. Every detail was meticulously considered by him. Having received a comprehensive science and engineering education in his previous life, Yudo's understanding of experimentation and technology surpassed 99.9% .9 of people in this world. An hour later, the machine stopped. At the end of the process, a cylindrical container, the size of a fist, was slowly released. Inside the cylinder was a mass of amber-colored viscous liquid. All the essence of the Hugachunin had been condensed into this form, blood, bone, flesh, meridians, and nerves, all transformed. This condensed viscous liquid was less than 30 milliliters. Yudo placed this precious liquid into a sterile container, and rested for a long time, waiting until his chakra was 80% restored before continuing. He then replaced the power source and loaded another body into the machine. Yudo was purifying, extracting all the essence from the Hyuga corpses. He aimed to supplement his own bloodline, breaking free from the caged bird's bondage required immense power. Now, having studied under Tsunade, created his own S-rank ninjutsu lion's fong bite, and practiced the in seal, Yudo was certain he would eventually master the strength of a hundred technique. With hard work, Yudo believed he would reach Kaga-level combat power. But even Kaga-level strength wasn't enough. In his past life, reading manga gave him a clear understanding. Even among Kages, the power gap could be greater than the gap between a Kage and a Genin, no one would ever compare Hashirama Senju with the fourth Kazakage Raza. Even if he acquired the combat power to become a Kage, the difference between barely passing and breaking the ceiling was immense. But Yudo was not an ordinary shinobi. Flowing in his veins was the same blood as the ancestor of Chakra. The Byakugan, the eyes of the ancestor of Chakra, held enormous potential. The Hyuga name, traced back many generations, is Atsutsuki. A Kekiai Genkai organ was powerful. The theoretical level of chakra that the body could refine was extraordinary. Combining these two aspects, every time Yudo thought of this, even he found it hard to believe. How did the Hyuga clan with such a powerful start end up like this? However, Yudo didn't care about the Hyuga clan's decline. Knowing that, supplementing and improving the bloodline could make the body lean towards Atsutsuki, was enough. The bloodline reversion plan had been on Yudo's mind for many years. Only after becoming Tsunade's disciple did he learn enough, and after extensive deliberation and preparation, he finally found enough materials to attempt implementation during the first week of the Third Shinobi World War. Four Chunin and one Jonin, an elite configuration capable of executing S-rank missions. This was strength that even some small ninja villages couldn't muster. These Hyuga corpses were enough for Yudo to initiate the first step of his bloodline supplementation. After an unknown amount of time, apart from Shinosuk, all five branch family members' bodies had been processed and converted into viscous liquid. Yudo carefully collected this precious liquid. He then added pre-prepared items into the culture dish filled with his own stem cells. Ex vivo cell culture, another technique Yudo mastered after refining his medical ninjutsu skills. Eat well, he said, placing the large culture dish in a constant temperature environment. Hope you bring me some surprises when you return to my body. Tien. 
Ex vivo cell culture refers to a form of in vitro cell culture that uses cells or tissue freshly collected from a living organism. In this process, living cells or tissues are taken from an organism and cultured in a laboratory apparatus under sterile conditions, with no alterations, for up to 24 hours. Yudo placed the petri dish into the incubator and relaxed. He had a knack for experiments and technology, adeptly adjusting environmental parameters like air pressure and humidity to optimize cell growth. By refining the liquid essence of the Huga clan and integrating it with his own stem cells for growth, he would extract them after a set period and reintroduce them into his body. In this process, the external cells effectively experienced a kind of intrauterine development, but their growth environment was the pure essence of the Huga clan. He was eager to see what changes would occur once these cells reintegrated into his body. Yudo was highly cautious about operations like transplanting Hashirama cells. Orochimaru had conducted human experiments on 60 children, transplanting Hashirama cells into each of them, with only one survivor, Yamato, who still couldn't compare to the first Hokage in power. Given such a high mortality rate, Yudo didn't dare to attempt it lightly. Cultivating his own stem cells to undergo mutations and reintroducing them repeatedly would spread the effects throughout his body. Since these were his cells, the likelihood of rejection was minimal. Additionally, there would generally be no uncontrollable outcomes during the absorption of Huga essence in the Petri dish. After all, the Huga clan was relatively insular. To prevent their Kekiai Genkai from leaking and to maintain class stability, they usually married within the clan, and most members shared blood relations going back several generations. Based on the cell division and growth cycle, it will take some more time. Yudo sat on the metal chair in his secret base, calculating the time. He suppressed his anticipation and excitement, trying to remain calm. Even though he operated as a free agent on the battlefield, his prolonged absence without reports would attract Minato's attention. Moreover, with the disappearance of Shinosuke Hyuga and his death squads, and the only survivor, Rurina Hyuga, dying of a brain thrombosis in the middle of the night, anyone with a bit of sense would realize these incidents were no coincidence. Kanoha and the Hyuga clan would certainly investigate. The Hyuga clan wouldn't tolerate the leakage of their Byakugan. Yudo knew he couldn't afford any mistakes. If things went wrong, not even Tsunade could protect him. Just rest a bit longer, then head out. Yudo watched the incubator's slow operation, his breathing gradually steadying. Half a month flew by. The Third Shinobi World War, which had started with tentative probing, finally erupted fully. Large-scale battles between shinobi forces led to a sharp increase in deaths, with jonin falling daily and obituaries flooding back to their homelands like snowflake. Initially, it was Kanoha versus Kumogakure and Sunagakure against Iwagakure. But within half a month, the number of warring factions increased. One day, Kanoha would battle Kumogakure, and the next, they would fight Kirigakure in the mist. All five great nations and their powerful shinobi villages were involved, without clear alliances, resulting in chaotic warfare. Small countries once again became battlegrounds, with the five great shinobi villages avoiding their territories and fighting in weaker nations. Although most shinobi had no interest in slaughtering civilians, the destructive power of those with chakra meant entire civilian populations near battlefields often perished. Tragedies unfolded daily. Calls for peaceful coexistence were quickly dismissed by certain factions as weakness, and such opinions were ignored. War was like a runaway train with broken brakes. It wouldn't stop unless its wheels shattered or it crashed into a mountain. On a particular day, on a certain grassland, dense clouds floated in the sky, blocking the sunlight, which filtered through with a ghastly crimson hue, like the gaze of a demon from hell. The scene on the ground was even more horrific. Severed limbs and blood were scattered across the ruined grass, with broken bodies everywhere. Groups of shinobi wearing headbands fought fiercely, relentlessly taking each other's lives. More precisely, 
It was a group of Kirigakure and Kumogakure shinobi surrounding a single young boy. The boy was wearing a Kanoha headband, a dark green standard jonin high collar vest, with a loose kimono underneath. His right arm was wrapped in black bandages, with a semi-transparent chakra arm guard roaring like a beast. His attire, age, speed, and techniques made him easily recognizable to the Kirigakure and Kumogakure shinobi. Yudo Hyuga, the rising genius of Kanoha since the war began. Kill this shinobi first, or none of us will survive. The leaders of Kirigakure and Kumogakure agreed, and led their subordinates in an attack on Yudo. Ha, decisive. Yudo chuckled, raising his right arm to casually block a Kumogakure shinobi's horizontal slash, while his free left hand gently pushed, sending a gentle fist strike that crushed the enemy's liver. During this period, after numerous battles, his mastery of the lion's fong bite had improved significantly. He could now control its temperature, force, and speed in a very short time, adjusting to the most suitable combat form when facing enemies. The Lone Lion of Kanoha was often used in battlefield reports by enemy shinobi villages to refer to Yudo. Yudo was quite pleased with this new nickname, finding it much better than the Jewel of the Hyuga nonsense. After killing the Kumogakure shinobi, Yudo squinted, and his lion's fong arm guard roared. The ground beneath his feet shattered as he used the force to charge into the midst of the Kirigakure and Kumogakure shinobi, slaughtering them all. To increase his efficiency, he first targeted and killed lower-ranking shinobi. Before long, the two teams of shinobi were terrified and retreated under the cover of their leaders, cautiously watching Yudo as they withdrew. The youth stood still, not pursuing. The Byakugan was not omnipotent and couldn't see through all traps. Reckless pursuit was never a good idea. Kirigakures, Fuguki Suikazan, and Kumogakures, Killer B, were both in this area. Caution was necessary. Slowly retracting his lion's fong arm guard, Yudo kept his Byakugan activated temporarily, then dashed into a dense forest, quickly leaving the battlefield. However, he didn't expect that just as he reached a small stream to wash the blood off his shoes, a toad suddenly jumped out of the water, carrying a scroll in its mouth. Yudo was startled but took the scroll, feeding the toad a piece of meat in return. Minato Senpai, sending a message, huh? Thanks for the effort. The little toad happily croaked before disappearing into the stream. With his right arm wrapped in black bandages, the young shinobi quickly read through the scroll. They finally tracked me down, TCH. The border between the land of hot water and the land of frost. With the arrival of the main forces, Kanoha has established a small camp here, using the nearby forest for timber and complementing it with earth release technique. The walls are thick enough to withstand a considerable level of ninjutsu attack. Seven days ago, Orochimaru arrived here with a large army, intensifying the chaotic battle among Kanoha, Kirigakure, and Kumogakure. Meanwhile, Jiraiya has taken combat troops to guard against Iwagakure and Sunagakure due to the mysterious disappearance of the third Kazakage, causing conflicts between the land of earth and the land of wind. For now, they have no capacity to expand eastward. However, everyone knows that a world war is inevitable. Yudo returned to Kanoha's newly established camp. After showing Minato's token to the guards, a genin messenger led him to the central area. Along the way, many people recognized him. Even if they didn't know his face, seeing the black bandage wrapped around his right arm, they realized he was the renowned Lone Lion. Yudo stopped in front of a tall domed building. After reporting his name at the door, the guards let him in. Inside, there were many people, including several freelancer. Minato sat on a high seat in the center, his warm blue eyes smiling. Yudo Kuen, thank you for hurrying back. Commander. Yudo saluted. With so many people around, he didn't say much and stood aside with his arms crossed. Minato cleared his throat. Seeing everyone present, he began. Orochimaru is still on the front line. There's no need to bother him with this. I hereby announce. He glanced around, his voice calm. 
that from now on, everyone in this room except for me and the village emissaries will take a few days off. The atmosphere suddenly became tense. There were 32 shinobi in the room, all experienced Chunin-level elites, whether from civilian backgrounds or Kanoha's noble clans, holding significant positions in their units. A few days off, isn't that just a euphemism for house arrest? Everyone's gaze slowly focused behind Minato. Standing behind the yellow flash were several individuals in masks and robes. They must be the village emissaries Minato referred to. These people are emissaries sent by the village. They are our own, so don't be nervous. Just cooperate with them. Minato paused and smiled lightly. After the rest, report back to me. You will either continue your positions or take on even more challenging tasks. In the end, wars between nations depend on you who fight on the front lines. Yudo raised an eyebrow, amused. Minato's words were well-crafted. He informed his subordinates to cooperate with the village's investigation, promised them their positions back or even promotions after it was over, and subtly warned the village emissaries not to forget who was fighting on the front lines. It made sense. Generals leading troops abroad despise backstabs and distrust from the rear. Minato's displeasure at the village emissaries investigating so many corps members was understandable. A monkey-masked emissary spoke softly. Commander Minato, rest assured, it's just a routine investigation. The yellow flash nodded noncommittally and was the first to leave the room. The others followed suit, waiting for the village emissary's questions. Yudo returned to the small house Minato had assigned him last week. Lying on the bed, he didn't train but pondered how to handle the village's inquiry. Before it was completely dark, an emissary called him back to the room. The interrogation was simple, calling suspects one by one, implying there had been ninja surveillance. Yudo stood silently. The monkey-masked man spoke first. Yudo Hyuga, Shinosuke Hyuga and his bodyguards are either missing or dead, likely with no hope. Unfamiliar voice, an ANBU captain? Yudo thought, but remained calm. I know about this. After our first clash with the Kumo Shinobi, Minato-sama informed me. Oh? What's your take on it? Young Master Shinosuke-sama sacrificed himself for Kanoha and the clan. He's a role model for me. A role model? The monkey mask nodded approvingly, as expected of Tsunade-sama's disciple. Besides Orochimaru and Minato, you're the most famous here. The lion's name has already reached the village. All thanks to Hokage-sama's guidance. Your lion's fong bite is indeed powerful technique. Your frontal assault and piercing abilities are formidable. That's why Minato allowed you to act freely as a free agent. Yes. So, no one knows what you do in your free time. No one can prove your whereabout. Also, your lion's fong can easily kill jonin-level opponents. That's right. Yudo admitted openly. So, where were you that night? In the Land of Frost, ambushing Kumo Shinobi. So no one can verify your story. Indeed. Yudo sighed, but that's the truth. On his way here, he had figured out the best strategy, to deny everything. Slug Sage had cleaned up the battle traces, and the bodies were transported between the Shikatsu Forest and the secret base. No external evidence could be found. Having the capability doesn't mean committing the act. If capability were evidence, Minato should be the first to be questioned. Using the Flying Thunder God to travel through space, he could wipe out Kanoha's advance team in one night. The monkey-masked man sighed. Other suspects had equally irrefutable alibis like, I didn't do it. Why would I kill Shinosuke? Why would I kill them? We're fighting Kumo and Kirigakure here and you're targeting your own people? I've contributed to Kanoha. I've shed blood for the village. I've been injured several times on this border. You're slandering me. I need to report this to the commander. No, I need to report this to the Hokage. This kind of unsolved case, with no bodies, was the hardest to handle, and the clues were few and useless, only offending people unnecessarily. Seeing the emissary silent for a long time, Yudo relaxed, but unexpectedly, 
a cat-masked emissary suddenly stepped forward, using body flicker to appear in front of the branch family boy. Their eyes met, and Yudo saw a pair of grief-stricken Byakugan. You bastard! As a branch family member, why did Shinosuke die and you lived? Though cloaked in a black robe, Yudo could tell from her waist and chest that this person was a woman, and this voice. Looking into those eyes filled with hate and sorrow, Yudo suddenly felt better. You had a good girlfriend, young master Shinosuk. Yudo lightly frowned, displaying a wronged and panicked expression, and respectfully said, Lady Miko, don't say my name with your filthy mouth? Miko Huga growled from her throat, stepping forward and grabbing Yudo by the collar. As a branch family member, your primary duty is always to protect the main family's safety. I ask you, Shinosuke is gone, why are you still alive? Yudo's lips quivered as he stammered. I'm sorry, Lady Miko, I wasn't on the front lines at the time. Good, good. You recognize your mistake. The Huga family didn't raise you for nothing. A cold light flashed in the girl's eyes, and her chakra instinctively flowed to her hand. Then take your apology and go underground with Shinosuk. Enough! A sudden roar exploded, and an umbu with a monkey mask instantly appeared between them, tightly gripping Miko's wrist. Yudo clearly saw the white skin of the girl's wrist being pressed into a few blue and purple marks, indicating the umbu was genuinely angry. Miko Hyuga, we represent the village. Put away your tantrums. As a shinobi you shouldn't act like this. And more importantly, this is not the Hyuga compound. A village envoy, killing an innocent combat personnel on the front lines, and that combat personnel was a disciple of the famous Sanin. Just thinking about it made the monkey-masked man shiver. If Yudo were to die without resistance, to quell the anger of the troops and Tsunade-sama, the entire group would definitely be skinned alive by the Hokage. Ah, uh, girls at this age, always doing reckless things for love. The monkey-masked man thought, releasing Miko's hand and standing in front of Yudo, Yudo Hyuga, you may go now. Thank you for your cooperation. Humph. The girl snorted coldly, glaring fiercely at the boy. I command you as a member of the main family, wait for me outside. At this moment, the monkey-masked man wanted to swallow Miko whole. Miko Hyuga, this is the final warning. In this situation, maliciously targeting combat personnel, I have the authority to dash, relax, I won't harm him. Miko lowered her head, taking a few deep breaths. I just want to talk. The monkey-masked man looked at her suspiciously but still kept his body shielding Yudo. Yudo respectfully bowed. Yes, Lady Miko. He smiled kindly at the monkey-masked man, then walked out of the room. Miko followed him out, and the monkey-masked Umbu could only pray that this girl, foolish in love, wouldn't do something as absurd as killing someone in the street. Yudo found a small, deserted hill and stood on it, looking back. Lady Miko, what do you want to say to me? The girl removed her mask. Her face was beautiful, her body curvy from years of gentle fist training, feminine yet strong. However, the scare of her eyes were red, indicating she had cried for a long time, likely ever since she received the news of Shinosuke's death. She looked pitiful, Yudo thought. Don't worry, I'll find a chance to reunite you too. After taking off her mask, Miko remained silent for a long time. She had many things she wanted to say. To the deceased Shinosuke, to her father who repeatedly reminded her before she left, and to her little follower, Naoto Hyuga. But she didn't know what to say to Yudo. Maybe it's those eyes similar to mine, even though he's just a branch family member. The girl sighed in her heart. When people are vulnerable, they instinctively seek out similar things to talk to, like speaking to a mirror. Lady Miko? The girl suddenly looked up, facing Yudo. I ask you, before Shinosuke, before he disappeared, did he show any strange behavior? No. Yudo thought seriously. Aside from Shinosuke's corpse condition after his death, he didn't know anything else. My duties in the unit were different from Shinosuke-sama's, so it was hard to see him, and even if we did meet. You weren't close, I understand that. Miko looked down at her toes, I mean, 
did he ever mention to anyone, even as a joke? Could you be more specific? Miko remained silent for a long time, then sighed. Forget it, no matter what I say now, it doesn't matter. Besides, with Shinosuke's personality, he wouldn't tell anyone about such things, not even the closest companions. He was that stubborn. Not necessarily, Yudo thought as he touched his nose. Your boyfriend became very obedient after his death, positioning his body in any way I wanted. Miko couldn't guess the thoughts in the boy's mind. After muttering a few words to herself, she turned and left. Yudo watched the girl's thin figure, tilted his head, and returned to his small room to secretly enjoy his leisure under the covers. The night passed like that. The next day, Minato Namikaze called the 32, suspects, together again and, in front of the village envoy, announced the end of the investigation. Everyone was reinstated, and some even received compensatory benefit. Yudo didn't stay in the camp for long. His attention was now focused on that petri dish, checking with his Byakugan every now and then, fearing the constant temperature environment would fail, causing all the cells to die. After ensuring no one was following him, he returned to his underground secret base. None of the traps or alarm devices he had set were triggered. The first thing Yudo did upon returning to the secret room was to check the temperature-controlled incubator. The situation inside the incubator was completely unexpected. In vitro cell proliferation, without special intervention, would gather into a lump of cells, generally forming irregular shapes. However, the stem cells growing in the Huga blood essence had taken an unexpected shape. A slice the size of one-fifth of a palm. The edges were extremely smooth, the thickness was a uniform one millimeter, and it was blood red. The shape was so regular it didn't seem like normal cell growth, as if it had been sculpted by some great force. Yudo's eyes were burning with excitement. He remembered that before returning to the Kanoha camp, the cells in the petri dish were still irregular lump. After two days away they had undergone such a transformation. Although, missing the mutation process, was regrettable, there would be more opportunities in the future. This mutation at least proved that his research direction was correct. The slightly pure Atsutsuki bloodline, flowing in the Huga main family member's body could indeed cause his cells to undergo secondary development. For three consecutive days, Yudo seldom ventured outside. Being a freelancer has its perks. Even if he disappears for a while, no one would suspect anything, with countless excuses at his disposal. Healing, ambushes, intelligence gathering. He had been in his underground base observing and recording, studying the piece of crimson skin. His stem cells, after devouring the concentrated essence of the Huga bloodline, had undergone such an exaggerated transformation. The smooth edges revealed a rough texture when observed at the cellular level. Over three days, the skin fragment did not grow any larger, and the Huga bloodline essence in the large petri dish did not change in quality either. The secondary development of the cells had concluded. Realizing this, Yudo took out the oval piece of skin. He weighed the remaining bloodline material and found that about half was left. The corpses of four Chunin and one Jonin are only enough to feed two pieces of this stuff. He roughly calculated, then activated his Byakugan. In the gray-black world, the skin piece appeared as a mass of chaos. His vision couldn't penetrate the mere one millimeter thickness of the skin. Yudo was not alarmed but delighted. Next, he used various medical ninja techniques to repeatedly test the skin, and after confirming it was non-toxic, he carefully held it in his hand. It felt cool, very light and smooth like a piece of peeled-off skin. He stared at the red oval skin in his palm. The meticulous effort to cultivate this thing was completely beyond his expectations. Whether it was the fragmented biological knowledge, he had seen before transmigrating or the medical ninjutsu taught by Tsunade in this life told him that in vitro stem cell culture should not have resulted in this. His original plan was to transplant the redeveloped cells back into his body 
to awaken the deeply hidden Atsutsuki bloodline through repeated cycles. However, it was evident that this oval piece of red skin was not suitable for transplantation. He admitted his understanding of chakra was still shallow. In any world, once superpowers were involved, experimental results tended to lean towards uncontrollable unknowns. But the facts were before him, and Yudo had no choice but to accept and overturn his initial assumptions. In the silent underground chamber, the youth rubbed the skin, pondering what could have caused this. In the past, someone from the Kekiai Genkai families must have conducted experiments to purify their bloodlines, right? The Hyuga clan had existed for over a thousand years, and he couldn't believe not a single scientifically inclined and curious clan member had tried it. Yet the Hyuga clan was still in decline, having produced no world-changing geniuses in years, suggesting that bloodline reversion, even if theoretically sound, wasn't feasible by conventional methods. Yudo had actually tried it with a mindset of giving it a shot. If it didn't work, he had other methods, like taking a big risk to steal Hashirama's cells, which were known to be a cheat code in the Naruto world, though it came with a high risk of death. However, his cells had undergone significant shape and characteristic changes during in vitro culture, which was rare enough to leave him stunned, unable to determine the cause of such mutation. The steps for Hyuga blood essence was simple, extracting the essence of their blood, flesh, and bones to create a bloodline crystal, serving as nourishment for the cell's redevelopment. So, was it due to the raw materials? His cells. Yudo touched his chest, remembering that he was a transmigrator, his biggest secret. But aside from the advantage of knowing the plot, being a transmigrator hadn't brought any other benefits. His talents were decent but not outstanding, likely not even surpassing Niji Hyuga, who would be born years later. If there was something different from the natives, it must be hidden deeper, like the soul. Chakra is a supernatural energy formed by the fusion of physical and spiritual energies. If spiritual energy could be broadly categorized as soul, then he indeed differed fundamentally from other shinobi, though drawing such a conclusion required extensive comparative experiments. Yudo shook his head to stop overthinking. He was a pragmatist, not one to get stuck in the dead end of exploring principles and processes. Since the cells had undergone a pleasing change, he would accept it and leave further considerations for later. So now the key was, how to use it. Yudo lightly weighed the skin. Swallow it raw? Stick it on a ninja tool? Imbue it with magic or something? He pondered for a while and suddenly realized that the piece looked very familiar. The color, size, and shape. An inspiration struck him. He took off his forehead protector and pressed the red skin onto his forehead. This posture was very similar to that of Kagaya Atsutsuki when she awakened the Rinne Sharingan. Like an ancient machine fitted with the most crucial gear, the incomplete body named Hyuga Branch Family came back to life at that moment. The red skin underwent a peculiar wave, like water poured into a lake, disappearing into Yudo's forehead. Chakra began to reconstruct, a new power forming within him, far surpassing his original strength, like comparing lead to cotton. It was a power vastly superior to the Byakugan. At this moment, the caged bird seal on his forehead disappeared, and the sealed, one-degree vision returned. The curse mark, perfected over millennia by the Hyuga main family, was completely suppressed by the overwhelming ocular power. Yudo trembled, touching his forehead, like a bird finally breaking out of its cage. Freedom, dignity, and the sense of security from having control over his own life made him so elated he couldn't think straight. I will be reborn in this world with a new form, my soul returns to me, no longer imprisoned by the caged bird seal. However, this joy of regained freedom did not last long. At a certain moment, the red oval skin fell from Yudo's forehead, landing on the ground like a lifeless paper scrap, devoid of its miraculous power. The caged bird seal returned to him, and the newfound power vanished. A slave imprisoned for ten years had only breathed fresh air for three minutes. Yudo, looking almost crazed,
picked up the skin and pressed it hard against his forehead, even until his skin bled, but it had no effect. At some point, the underground chamber returned to its usual tranquility. Yudo lay on the ground, closing his eyes without sorrow or joy. In his hand was a piece of red skin that had lost its mystical power. It was the glass slipper of Cinderella, also known as the God's Mask. Yudo Kuen, I'm leaving. It's up to you here. Ha ha. Minato Namike's golden hair shone brilliantly under the sun, making him look even more heroic in his battle gear. Please don't tease me, Minato Senpai. Yudo was dressed the same as usual. His right arm wrapped in black bandages, a white wide-sleeved robe draped over a dark green vest. I'm just a small free agent here. We still have Lord Orochimaru. Sometimes, too much humility isn't a good thing. Minato patted the branch family's young shinobi on the shoulder. We tallied the battle achievements a few days ago. You've made so many contributions over the past few months that it scared even me. On the battlefield, when enemies hear the name Lone Lion, they tremble. Yudo shook his head. I'm still far from matching the famous Yellow Flash. Haha, <laughs> so work even harder, Yudo Kuen. I hope to hear about the lion even when I'm fighting the Awagakure forces in the Land of Rain. Minato Senpai, I'll do my best. After exchanging a few more words, Minato Namikaze used the Flying Thunder God technique to vanish. Yudo looked towards the Land of Rain, the sound of cicadas ringing in his ears, then turned around and walked out of the camp under the respectful gazes of many Kanoha shinobi. It was now summer, and Yudo had been on this chaotic battlefield among Kanoha, Kumogakure, and Kirigakure for four months. Four months and over a hundred battles of various sizes. The name Lone Lion had spread throughout the major shinobi nations. The black bandages and the slightly handsome face, the roaring lion-like ninjutsu. At just thirteen, Yudo had become a rising star on the battlefield, a key figure in Kanoha's propaganda, and was recognized as one of the outstanding young talents of the Land of Fire. Although he couldn't compare to the Yellow Flash, the name Lone Lion was still quite prominent. At least on the enemy shinobi villages and bounty stations target lists, the Bounty 4 Lone Lion Yudo Hyuga had reached 45 million Ryo, higher than the 12 Guardian Ninja of the Land of Fire. However, as Yudo's reputation soared, the world grew even more turbulent. Iwagakure and Sunagakure seemed unsatisfied with their solo battles and dragged Kanoha into the fray. The three sides had already skirmished several times in the Land of Rain, and a full-scale war seemed imminent. Due to the immense pressure from the third Tsuchika Janoki, Hiruzen had also dispatched Minato. Before leaving, Yudo, seen as one of Minato's trusted subordinates, naturally came to bid farewell. After saying goodbye to Minato, Yudo once again left the camp. He had grown adept at moving alone, mastering skills like concealing his presence, luring enemies, and making quick escapes. These abilities were now ingrained in his body like instincts. Of course, these skills were acquired at the cost of painful lessons from ambushes. Yudo's long list of achievements was soaked in blood, both his and others. After winding through the area, he returned to his underground secret base. In a large tank, the body of Shinosuk Hyuga still soaked. It was the only main family body Yudo had obtained, which might still be useful, so he hadn't squeezed it dry. As for the other Hyuga clan members he had captured over the months, they had all been turned into nutrients for cell cultivation to create the God's Mask. Even in wartime, Hyuga bodies were hard to come by. Yudo knew that after Shinosuk and his guardians disappeared, the main family and the village had become vigilant. Any lone Byakugan user could be a trap, waiting for him to take the bait. So he remained cautious, occasionally going out for hunting. After necessary tests, Yudo now had only two God's Mask. Creating one God's Mask required at least one Jonin or four Chunin and Yudo could only temporarily gain powerful ocular abilities for a short three minutes by merging with a mask. Moreover, through external reproduction of other Hyuga cells, he confirmed his suspicion that as a transmigrator, 
his cells uniquely underwent complete level transcendence to form the god's mask. The mask was the key to supplementing his bloodline defect, but it was clearly not a complete key, as it couldn't be maintained for long. In the three-minute duration, his eyes transformed, and the chakra refined by his body became vastly different. He aptly named this state, Mask Mode, in true Naruto fashion, but once the time elapsed and the key was exhausted, he reverted to being a caged bird. Creating a stable key required other components, and finding those components necessitated the three-minute mask mode. Thus, he continued his journey of collecting corpses. Despite everything, Yudo was content with his current situation. At least his goals were clear, and he had a trump card up his sleeve. Three minutes of power was quite substantial, after all, the sage mode of Mount Mayaboku only lasted a few minutes. Walking along the path was reassuring, especially since today Yudo intended to take another significant step forward. He spent two hours in the underground base, finishing his meditation training by dusk. Yudo discarded his clothes, changed into a gray-black robe, and used the transformation jutsu to maintain the appearance of an adult male. Finally, he donned a fearsome mask and surfaced. Skillfully maneuvering through the mountains, he arrived at a valley, making hand signs in front of a special marker. The underground door opened again, revealing the bounty station's branch in the land of hot water. Led by an attendant, Yudo delved deeper underground to a hidden stone chamber. Please state your name and key, sir. A woman in a rat-faced mask appeared. Bounty station attendants all dressed like this. Aizen Suke. Aizen Sosuke Sama. After verifying his identity, the woman respectfully asked, How may I assist you today? I'm here to exchange something. Very well, sir. May I see the item? Though I'm not a shinobi, I can provide a preliminary evaluation based on my training. All right. Yudo nodded and took out a glass jar filled with preservative solution. Oh, a human organ? No problem, this kind of. The rat-faced woman's voice abruptly stopped, as if something had gripped her throat. She looked up sharply, her eyes filled with unprecedented reverence and fear, staring at the man in the demonic mask opposite her. In the small glass jar, a pure white eye floated in the preservative liquid. The bounty station's long history can be traced back to the Warring States period. The darkness and greed in people's hearts nourished this underground flower. Bathed in blood and money, the bounty station grew, with its complex network and intelligence points extending to every country in the world. Secretly, it was even called the Great Nation Without Land. Yet, despite its power, the bounty station's transaction records did not include any cases involving the Byakugan. Although the Hyuga clan is not as powerful as the Senju or Uchiha clans, it has been a prestigious family for thousands of years. From ancient times to the present, it has rarely fallen out of the top tier of shinobi clans. The clan guarantees jonin-level experts, who, if they all mobilized, could destroy a small country. Even now, as their influence wanes, the Hyuga are still formidable. Additionally, with Kanoha's protection, seizing the Byakugan is like stirring a hornet's nest. Provoking the Hyuga is a very troublesome matter. Moreover, due to the branch family's self-destruction mechanism and the main family's bloodline guards, obtaining a complete Byakugan is extremely difficult. Obtaining one is already tough, and selling it to the bounty station is even rarer. Risking great danger to extract a Byakugan and not implanting it into oneself, but rather exchanging it for money, is almost unthinkable for shinobi who crave power. However, today, this unprecedented transaction appeared at the branch of the bounty station in the land of hot water. In the deepest underground chamber of the land of hot water's bounty station, a bald man with a tattoo on his face took a sip of hot tea, looking at the man opposite him, who wore an oni mask. He respectfully said, Aizen Sosuke-sama, I am the person in charge here. You can call me. Viper. Viper. Yudo replied. So, you're the one negotiating this deal with me. Yes sir. You are our esteemed customer. 
Yudo sneered, placing his hands behind his head and leaning back. It was a very relaxed and comfortable posture, but to Viper, it was a testament to this man's overwhelming strength. Even in such an awkward position, the man named Aizen Sosuke exuded a powerful confidence. Viper took a deep breath and placed a small glass bottle on the table. Sir, the item you brought has been authenticated. It is indeed a genuine Byakugan, with no signs of sealing and in excellent condition. Hmm. Yudo responded indifferently. Do you dare to take it? Sir, you yist. Our bounty station would sell our lives for the right price. Viper chuckled, continuing, This kind of rare organ of a Kekiai Genkai is always in high demand. My estimate is 1.2 billion Rio. The average bounty for a Kanoha Jonin is about 30 million Rio. The price of four Jonin's deaths is enough to fund a raid on a small country. Implanting the Byakugan grants a 360-degree field of vision and X-ray vision. Properly preserved, it can be used for many generations. Whether for reconnaissance or protection, it is highly useful. Coupled with its priceless nature, it indeed is worth the price. My offer is fair, and it's my limit, Viper thought. The mysterious man opposite him, a fierce individual daring enough to extract a Byakugan, had a reputation for being as ruthless as a viper and as venomous as a spider. Viper did not dare provoke such a formidable character, nor did he dare to pull any tricks to lower the price. Heh! Yudo gently tapped the Oni mask's horn, producing a dull thud. In the silent underground chamber, the sound was exceptionally clear. Viper felt as if the man wasn't tapping the mask, but using his finger to dig out his heart. Too much money is just a number. Yudo suddenly spoke, let's barter. Of course, Aizen Sosuke-sama. Viper exhaled in relief. What do you need? I'm quite interested in that hard-boned clan. Yudo's tone was casual, as if discussing dinner plans. I want two live members of the Kagaya clan, awakened with the Shikatsumiyaku. Viper closed his eyes. Exchanging Byakugan for Shikatsumiyaku was a reasonable trade, not too difficult. However, obtaining them alive, the bounty station did have the capability to accomplish this. The Kagaya clan was strong, but it was a time of chaos, offering many opportunities. However, absolute caution was necessary to avoid exposing the bounty station as the mastermind and becoming a target of Kirigakure's wrath. To mobilize resources of this level, Viper's rank wasn't sufficient. Aizen Sosuke-sama, the bald man deliberated, I need to report to headquarters. Can you wait? Within two days, no. I'll give you an answer within a day. All right. Yudo responded softly. As he stood up under Viper's respectful gaze, he suddenly stopped before leaving the chamber. Keep your mouth shut. Viper smiled obsequiously. Aizen Sosuke-sama, rest assured, this matter will remain absolutely confidential. At least in the land of hot water, no one but us will know. If the secret gets out, you can take my head. Exchanging Byakugan for Shikatsumiyaku, a scheme that offends two great nations, must indeed be handled with utmost caution. Yudo nodded, seemingly approving Viper's shrewdness. Yudo left the underground chamber, walking for several kilometers before checking his surroundings with the Byakugan and changing his clothes. He did not dispel the transformation technique, but changed his appearance and voice entirely. He walked further, without a set direction, casually strolling until he reached a town. The land of hot water was a famous country, renowned for its hot springs. Despite the ongoing war, the town's residents lived relatively well, certainly better than those in the land of rain. Yudo found a tavern and sat inside, quietly observing the street. Finally, as the sun was about to set, he saw a caravan. In the shinobi world, there were no railways crossing the wilderness. Cities were relatively isolated from each other, and these traveling caravans played a significant role in transmitting news and information. If the land is the body, the roads are blood vessels, and the cities are organs, then these traveling merchants are the nervous system transmitting information. 
Many street rumors, when heard by those who know the truth, are like thunder from a clear sky. More importantly, information from the bottom up can never reveal its source. For both the instigator and the transmitter, this was the safest way. In the caravan, a few children were happily playing, innocent and carefree. Yudo bought a bag of candies and called the children over. What were you singing just now? It's the goose song. We learned it in that city to the west. The children, enticed by the candies, let down their guard and answered while sniffing. Oh, the goose song. Yudo patted the child's head. How about I teach you a new song? You can sing it in other cities and make others envious. Sure. Learning a new song means we can exchange it with other kids. Ha <laughs> ha. Exchange and sharing, such a good thing. Yudo smiled warmly. He cleared his throat and softly hummed, white eyes, hard bones. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.